Uh, good morning, and can I welcome everybody to the 15th meeting of the Education and Culture Committee in 2015. Uh, can I remind all those present that electronic devices should be switched off at all times. The first item uh, for us this morning is to decide whether to take item 6 on our response to the SPCB on Scotland's Commissioner for Children and Young People in Private. The members agree? That's agreed. Thank you very much. Uh, our next item is to take evidence on the Historic Environment Scotland Act 2014 and Ancillary Provisions Order 2015. And can I welcome to the committee Fiona Hislop, the Cabinet Secretary for Culture, Europe and External Affairs, and her supporting officials. Good morning uh, to all of you. Um, after we've taken evidence on the instrument, we'll debate the motion in the name of the Cabinet Secretary at item 3. Officials, of course, are not permitted to contribute to the formal debate. Uh, can I begin um, by inviting the Cabinet Secretary to make uh, some opening remarks. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you, Convener. Good morning. Uh, this order is part of a group of instruments which we have laid to complete the actions which implement the Historic Environment Scotland Act 2014, which the Committee considered last year. Uh, the other instruments all follow the negative procedure, but they are related to the affirmative order before us today. Uh, we have consulted extensively on the details of procedure dealt with in these instruments, and I'll publish the the government response to that consultation very shortly. There was widespread agreement with our own views as to the best way forward in general and on matters of detail, so we've been able to follow a consensual route in preparing this order as well as in the other instruments. Historic Environment Scotland will assume the existing functions which Historic Scotland and RCAMS carry out from 1st of October this year and will take on new, broader remit um, on the same date. Uh, turning to the order in front of us, uh, I can summarise its purpose very quickly. This order changes several pieces of primary legislation where the Scottish ministers currently have a role so that Historic Environment Scotland is named, enabling it to perform those functions from the 1st of October. These functions involve Historic Environment Scotland being consulted or playing other roles to support other bodies who are charged with decision-making functions. The order sets out transitional arrangements um, for situations where administrative processes are in not are not completed at the date of change, and these are intended to avoid any double handling or of any delay for those who are awaiting decisions. The order also uh, adds Historic Environment Scotland to enactments which list bodies required to adhere to statutory public procurement and regulatory standards. The specific enactments which uh, this order changes to ensure Historic Environment Scotland's role are the Roads Scotland Act 1984, the Building Scotland Act 2003, the Land Reform Scotland Act 2003, the Housing Scotland Act 2006, and the Environmental Assessment Scotland Act 2005. A uh, few of the enactments dealt with in this order generate substantial volumes of consultation or other work. The bulk of the regulatory and consultation work for, for Historic Environment Scotland will arise from the Ancient Monuments Act and the listed Buildings Act and from a range of planning and environmental impact assessment regulations. The principal acts for these areas already cover the new dispositions, which means the revised procedures can be implemented by changes to regulations which follow negative uh, procedure. Finally, uh, this order adds Historic Environment Scotland to the Procurement Reform Scotland Act 2014 and the Regulatory Reform Scotland Act 2014 to require it to operate according to the standards expected of public bodies in these areas. Uh, finally, the order helps deliver the government's commitment to position Historic Environment Scotland as the national lead body uh, in our collective efforts to understand, protect and value Scotland's historic environment and contributes to setting the high standards which we expect Historic Environment Scotland to uphold. Um, I would welcome this committee's support for these provisions. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Um, do any members have any questions to ask at this stage? Can I just clarify? Sorry, Chuck Brody. Good morning. Can I just ask? Um, no, no, no problem with, with, with the order. But uh, what management changes are likely to take place uh, by changing or, or consolidating the organisations under HES? 
Uh, that's a big question which was uh, discussed with the committee at length uh, during the actual consideration by the committee of the primary legislation in the Act. Uh, considerable management changes, they have been in effect for a significant amount of time already. Um, uh, in terms of uh, procedure that we're currently in the process of recruiting the new chief executive, the new board has already been established and is already meeting. So the transition process and the management changes are being effected as was discussed with the committee when they were looking at the primary legislation. Oh, sorry, 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 Chick. We'll be happy to, to forward you some information about that if that's helpful okay. for your background. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Can I just check, Cabinet Secretary, about the consultation? Uh, I believe there were two consultations which affect this particular order, the one in summer 2013 and then the one on the changes to regulatory arrangements which took place in the winter of 14-15. Uh, it's just to ensure that those, those consultations did cover directly the, the changes that are now being... being yes, indeed, but I'm happy for... Yes. No, would you want to? The, uh, the changes are... Uh, in, in the large scale which were set out in the Act were covered by the first consultation, uh, so that's at the framework. The second consultation very much looked at the detail, looked at draft regulations, transitional provisions and so forth. We dealt with a group of nine uh, regulations as they were then drafted. Uh, we put those out as full draft regulations, we received comment on them and we have then analysed that comment and taken it on board. There have been some very minor changes to the drafting generally. The response was very positively in favour of the arrangements as set out here in general and in detail few queries about uh, very minor technical matters which we've addressed. Okay. And we're publishing the report on that uh, in the next week. That's very helpful. Thank you very much for that. Any further questions? Okay, can I, I'll now move to agenda item three. Um, uh, as indicated, we now move to the formal debate on the instrument, uh, which is item three. And can I invite the Cabinet Secretary to speak and speak to and move the motion? Uh, can we now just move the motion that the Education and Culture Committee recommends that the Historic Environment Scotland Act 2014 and Ciliary Provision Order 2015 be approved? Uh, thank you. Uh, any contributions from members? I presume you don't wish to respond. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> can I put the question, therefore, to the committee that the motion S4M 13406 be agreed to? Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Uh, thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Um, and I'll suspend the meeting briefly. Our next item is to take evidence on the Education Scotland Bill. Um, can I, before we do that, though, can I uh, thank everyone who has made written submissions on the bill to the committee? We received almost uh, 100 submissions, which will help to inform our detailed scrutiny of the bill in the coming weeks. Uh, we'll also take evidence from two panels of, of witnesses today, the first of whom will cover the bill's provisions on attainment, inequalities of outcome and on a pr proposed chief education officer. Can I welcome to the committee this morning Keir Bloomer, uh, representing Reform Scotland, uh, Professor Sally Brown from the Royal Society of Edinburgh, Professor Sue Ellis, uh, Joseph Browntree Foundation, and Ian Glennie, Scotty, Scottish Secondary Teachers Association. Uh, welcome to uh, all of you. Uh, I'm going to move straight to questions, if you don't mind, from committee members, um, and we're going to start with Chick Brody. Yes, I wonder, good morning. Uh, in, in terms of the, the submissions that we've had, there's a vast range of as you would expect, opinion. I just wonder what, to what extent uh, do you think legislation in general it can contribute to closing uh, the uh, uh, attainment gap as opposed to you know, custom and practice? That seems to be a very important question. Um, my view and the view of, the, uh, of Reform Scotland is that the answer is only to a very negligible extent. 
Uh, what is proposed in the legislation at the present moment, it seems to me, has only one guaranteed effect, which is that every two years there will be a frenetic outburst of activity preparing reports. So we will get lots of bureaucratic action, we will get lots of reports, most of them in competition with each other trying to demonstrate huge quantities of activity. But uh, that is not, after all, the purpose of what is being put forward. What is being put forward is basically a, a statement of aspiration. And looking through the evidence, uh, the only uh, argument in favour of putting such an aspiration into law that I have seen is that it will help to raise awareness. Now, actually, that is addressing a problem that I think we do not have. Um, as we've said in our evidence, Scotland has been aware of this problem for the best part of half a century, Successive governments in good faith have made all kinds of initiatives in order to tackle it. The profession has been solidly behind it, but the success achieved so far has been negligible. So the problem is not that people are insufficiently aware of the issue. The problem is that we have not got an agreed consensus on the way forward to tackle it. So my view is that legislation has very little to contribute on this. Any other views? The, the view of, of, of the Joseph Ramtree Foundation is that it is useful because it does put it on the agenda and it sends a clear signal to people involved in education that this is an issue has, that has to be tackled. One of the um, things that came up when we were doing the preparation for the Joseph Ramtree systematic review that we did last year was I looked through all the advice given to schools for the extent to which that advice framed issues in terms of poverty. So I looked at things like Gerfet, getting it right for every child, um, how good is our school, all that legislation, all, all, that, all that policy advice to schools. And what was interesting was gender was mentioned, looked after children was mentioned, um, educational support and children with special needs was mentioned. Poverty was, was in a, wasn't mentioned at all as an issue. And so I think one of the things that is useful about the law is that it's putting it very clearly on the agenda. It is asking local authorities to collect data, and, but the difference won't be made by the local authorities collecting the data. The difference will be made by schools, head teachers, and teachers who take that data and actually use it to make a difference to the children they teach. Sorry to interrupt, <coughs> if I may ask. You, given that duty and that responsibility, would strengthening the duty make um, any appreciable difference, in your opinion, to the potential impact of the legislation? Um, no, I, th I think that you want to... Um, what will make an impact to the, diff to the impact of legislation will be the extent to which um, national advice, local authority advice and school advice actually lines up and marries... Marries together, and, and so that schools and head teachers are getting the um, clear advice about clear signposts about what matters and clear information about what works. That's what's going to make a difference. Okay, Mr. Glenny, Professor Brown. We uh, we support the legislation, uh, and it will bring. Uh, the attainment up, but unfortunately, we feel that the funding aspects that I think there are unforeseen funding things that are happening in schools. A lot of our members in schools are currently complaining about the, the lack of resources in schools caused by local authority cuts, local government cuts. And at the point is getting to the, we're actually no longer being able to buy the resources we could buy five years ago. Now, resources do not make education. Um, teachers make education supported by resources, but one without the other becomes a very, very difficult thing to move it, the attainment gap, close it down, and we feel that the resourcing impacts of this legislation need to be looked at very carefully. Perhaps I, I mean, I largely agree with what has been said. It seems to me that the legislation is a necessary initial statement to say, this is on your agenda, this is on our agenda. And there are other things that go along with that. For example, the First Minister showing some interest in the London Challenge and in New York schools. This is already, these are all okay as signals, but of course they're nowhere near enough. And as Keir Bloomer identified, we have for a very long time, not just in Scotland, but throughout the world, put an awful lot of emphasis on this as an idea 
but we haven't had the success that one might have expected given the amount of effort that has been put into it. Of course, if you look at the kind of work that the Roundtree Foundation has uh, undertaken, and particularly through Strathclyde in the Scottish context, we actually do know a fair bit about the sorts of strategies that can be used in order to develop the kinds of reductions in gaps of attainment that we're looking for. But we don't understand it by any means fully. I mean, one of the things that comes over is that you need much more engagement of schools with parents and families. And while there have been an absolute plethora of what people have seen as good ideas that might work, we have very little in the way, particularly in Scotland, we have very little in the way of proper evidence about what does and doesn't work. Of course, the um, work at Strathclyde is a very good starting point, but we're pretty low on that kind of work across the board. We like to think of the ways in which we personally think something could be done. We're not so good at looking at the evaluation of how effective that has been. I just wonder one more question, if I may, Convener. Um, collecting data is important, as long as it doesn't transmogrify into, you know, we start setting targets again, as opposed to trying to achieve outcomes. I just wonder, having said it, okay, it's on the agenda, uh, we have had some indication of strategy. I wonder if, uh, if there are any more effective legislative uh, measures that might be introduced to not just put it on the agenda, but to start to see uh, effective outcomes. Ms. Bloomer? My problem is you, your use of the word legislative there. I, I suspect that uh, my answer to the question you've actually asked is no, because I don't think that legislation itself will contribute very much. There is a lot that can be done to address the problem. Well, uh, as Professor Brown has already said, the evidence that uh, Sue Ellis has provided you with has got a great many good ideas in it. I would like to think that our own evidence from Reform Scotland has some good ideas as well. Um, an issue which I think needs to be taken much more seriously than it ever has been in the past is how you create appropriate mechanisms for bringing about change. Scotland has never been short of good educational ideas. What it has always been short of is the means of putting them into effect. And you see that, for example, in, re in relation to Curriculum for Excellence. Curriculum for Excellence is an admirable programme in many ways, but there is an astonishing amount wrong with the way in which it is being implemented. Now, that's not your subject for the morning. I mean, I'll, I'll say more if you want me to, but I'll leave it at that uh, at the present moment. So I think this issue of how to bring about change is crucial. And a point which I think uh, is, is very important here is I'm assuming that nobody in the room wishes to see us close the gap by reducing levels of attainment at the top, although that has happened on some occasions in Scotland. I noticed that the, the Cabinet Secretary in the motion, which I think was discussed in Parliament about a week or so ago, uh, referred to us as being a country in a mid-table position in relation to international comparisons, with the implication that that was not good enough. Now, if we are going to address the issue of attainment overall, i.e. raise standards for everyone, and simultaneously close the gap by raising standards even faster, for those who are most seriously underperforming at the moment, then that calls for an acceleration in the rate of change in Scottish education of an order of magnitude. Because what is clear over the past 20 years, if you look at our position in international tables, is that we may have been improving, but we have been improving at a pace slow enough that others have been able to overtake comparatively comfortably. So in other words, we are a very long way from having the kind of mechanisms in place that will allow us to address a problem of this complexity uh, in the kind of time scale that is required and at the pace of change that is required. Okay, thank you. Professor Ellis. 
I think that the, um, what you need to do to close the gap, I think the sort of images that you have are really important. And what we know in Scotland is that the gap starts off um, before children come to school, but it widens as children move through schooling. And what that indicates is that you have a school system which is not serving all children equally well. Now, making sure, looking at what it is about that system and making sure that the system serves all children equally well it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to lower the attainment of anyone else. It's not like some sort of scales where if you put something on or, or you take something out of one, you have to take something out of one thing to put it into another. So that's the first thing. The second thing that I think Roundtree would be emphasising is that this is an issue that applies to all schools in Scotland. Um, two, roughly two-thirds of children in, in, in poverty in Scotland don't go to schools in areas of poverty. But that means that you've got very, very different contexts for change. And if you have high, schools with um, a small percentage of children in poverty, 5 or 6%, schools with a sort of average percentage of 20%, and schools with much more, those are three very different contexts with face, and that face different issues, different affordances, and have different levers for change. So what you will need is local solutions for each of those things but then national narratives about change, about what works in each of those contexts. Because the people who make the difference, teachers and head teachers, need to have such examples that are not generic, but examples of contexts like theirs. And if, you, um, if you've got a, a very middle-class school um, with a very small percentage of kids in poverty, the danger is that those kids then become very, very isolated and... So the issue that that school has to face is very different from the sort of issue that a school with a high percentage of kids in poverty has to face. So that, I think, is probably... That's not something that you can legislate for, to come back to your question, but it is something that you actually do need national knowledge building about, and it need, that's what needs to be on the, on the national agenda. Thank you. Well, it's... It seems to me that we need very much to make use of what other people have already found. I mean, for example, the complexity of the strategy to achieve this very important strategic aim, but a strategic aim is, of course, not the same as a strategy, needs to take account of what things have been like in the experience of others. I mean, the closest one to us, in a sense, is the London Challenge, and I think it has a lot to tell us about the time that it takes to develop this. You know, we're not going to do this by next Monday afternoon. And also about the different elements, and we put this in, into our report, that come up when the evaluations overall of these kinds of very ambitious, and this is a very ambitious goal, when these ambitious goals are addressed. But at the same time, we want to take account, I mean, I've already mentioned um, the uh, Strathclyde work that you're hearing from today. And one of the things that it does in the paper is it talks about the situation under which you get the worst outcomes when you're trying to achieve something of this kind. And it, for example, talks about um, the difficulties of short-term external support for tuition or hit-and-run interventions or developments, and interventions that rely on anecdotal evidence. And I would have to say, I mean, we mentioned just now, this is not a, this is not a session about curriculum for excellence and its reform, but we do need to learn from that. And one of the things that has been very striking about the government strategy for curriculum reform has been its fragmentation. Enormous numbers of groups and committees have been set up to do different things and in different places. And they've had virtually no collaborative engagement um, and indeed no mutual accountability. And accountability is very important. And it seems to me that that's something that we really need to go for. That doesn't mean to say, I mean, somebody the other day accused me of being back on an old research and development. Well, I'm not on an old model. I really want to be on a new model. But that doesn't mean to say that you don't have development and that you don't have research and you don't, of course, have collaboration. I mean, I thought it was very interesting that the SIP report 
that came out from Education Scotland quite recently was a collaborative exercise of Education Scotland with schools and also with some collaboration from Glasgow University. But it didn't tell us anything about the impact on the whole system. It told us, because the only data that it reported was teachers' preferences and views, what the teachers like this kind of collaborative exercise. And 50 years ago, I was a teacher, and we had collaborative exercises then in the 1960s, and we really liked them, and they were really valuable. So that isn't a new finding. What it didn't tell us was, have we looked at any basic measure which would allow us in the future to say whether the intervention had had any effect? <clears throat> you can't just measure something at the end. You have to measure it at the baseline as well. And that seems to be something that we've neglected, both in the Curriculum for Excellence and if we're not careful, we might do it in this new strategic goal. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Can I call Mark Griffin? Thanks, Kavina. And I think um, most of us can see the kind of things that are having an impact on educational attainment in our communities. You can see um, more affluent families paying for extra tuition for their children. We can see more affluent parents paying for transport and using the place and request system to move their kids out of schools they're seen as perhaps not doing as well to schools that are higher performing. And that's um, just the, the families who haven't specifically bought houses and paid extra money to buy houses in um, catchment areas for perceived better schools. We have uh, more affluent parents who are better educated and are so are able to help out with their children's homework. Um, is, are any of the measures in this bill going any way to, to address those drivers of inequality? And should the government actually be consulting on what they can do to, um, well, not um, taking away any of those measures because you don't want to reduce the ability and attainment of, of people at the top, but actually consulting on the kind of issues that can readdress that and balance, like... Um, homework clubs, um, whether that's adult learning classes to improve um, the educational ability of, of parents to, to teach their children. Should the government be consulting on um, specific measures and policy interventions like those and look at introducing, um, um, including those in the legislation? Okay, thank you. Could I Professor Brown, yeah. start there. I mean, it seems to me that the most important thing to do is... Um, I mean, on the one hand, you've identified the sorts of characteristics of families and so on that perhaps lead to lower attainments in those who are somewhat disadvantaged. And it's to do with parental education, it's to do with occupation and all these things that you've mentioned. But one of the things, and Sue can probably tell you more about this than I can, but one of the things that the uh, Roundtree Foundation work has done, and of course this hasn't just been in Scotland, is that it's found that the most promising area is engagement of schools with families. And there are a number of different ways in which they can engage in families. I mean, we've always done a lot of, of telling uh, families what they ought to do, and quite often they've done absolutely nothing about it. But the Roundtree Foundation does have some research which indicates what actually might work. And it seems to me that that's the sort of thing that we should be focusing in now. We should be focusing on what do we know from Scotland and other places about examples that do work? What are the examples that might work? I mean, they look sort of promising, but we haven't really got hard evidence. And what are the things that we know that we may be very adhering very strongly to that actually don't work? And it seems to me that the big question, I mean, the, the, we were talking about having a requirement on local authorities to report on, you know, that they're paying attention. But what we need to focus on now is, and how do we make a difference? I mean, Scotland is certainly not leading at the moment. If it put enough effort into it, of course it could. 
um, and that's that seems to me to be what we need to what we need to do. Can I, can I just come back on that, yes. that point there? When we're speaking about what work and what works and what we think could work, is is there an argument for um, if if we have consulted and we have identified what does work, is there an argument for including sp specific policy initiatives within the legislation? Yes, they would, providing they start on a small scale and pilot, uh, you know, pilot work is done. I mean, one of the big dissatisfactions with the Curriculum for Excellence was that no pilot work was done. And you learn an enormous amount. You learn about things which look as if they might be successful and are worth going on with. We also learn about what doesn't work. And you get some understanding of why things work and why they don't work. But if you drop in everybody into it straight away then you're much less well informed. I think that there is a difficulty about using legislation as the vehicle for doing this. The government has plenty of means at its disposal for sponsoring initiatives of whatever kind in relation to closing the gap. It doesn't need to legislate in order to do it. And the difficulty about legislation is that you then have a prescribed list of approved ways of going about things which it is difficult to change and which may, in the light of experience, be demonstrated not to have been the best chosen examples. Uh, I, I return to the question of how you bring about change in a large and complex system like education, and I don't think you bring it about primarily by top-down action. One of the questions I think that has to be asked is, do schools see themselves as customers of the national agencies, the main national agencies in this case being Education Scotland and to a lesser extent Scottish Qualifications Authority. Do they believe that these are places where they can get help in resolving the problems that they are actually experiencing? Now, I suspect that the answer to that question is no. They tend to see these agencies as ways of imposing upon them policies devised further up the system. And that seems to me to be the wrong way round. We have always had uh, three levels of educational governance. We've had a national level, we've had a local authority level, and there is a school level. I am not sure that we are any longer clear about what the functions of these three levels are. On the one hand, there has been a growing tendency for micromanagement from the national level or from the national level's agencies. In the period since the last local government reorganisation in the 1990s, a reorganisation that most people were very unhappy with at the time, and it's astonishing it's lasted as long as it has, but in that intervening period, partly as a result of the much lower average size of authorities and partly as a result of funding uh, constraint, the ability of that middle tier to function in the way that it ha was originally intended has been seriously impaired. And there is yet insufficient recognition of the importance of initiative at the level of the school. Schools in Scotland are more empowered than they are in many parts of the world, but they are less empowered than they need to be. So there is a need for a significant adjustment in our model uh, of governance so that it encourages innovation at the different levels and of, uh, and of kinds that are appropriate to the different levels. But am I suggesting that you uh, take some of the excellent suggestions that you've received and legislate them into universal existence? Most certainly not. That would be a very retrograde way of addressing the problem. I think, I think right. Legislation is too clunky for this sort of approach. But you do have a national level of advice that should be giving quite strategic advice to schools and local authorities about what's going to give the biggest payoff and how to get there. And at the moment, that strategic advice isn't always absolutely clear to schools. So there's 101 initiatives coming out, but how a school or a local authority chooses from those initiatives is, is not always very clear. Things like the book bug is, a, is an excellent initiative, but it needs a sort of a strategic layer above it that says reading engagement matters, these are the sorts of, this is why it matters, and these are the sort of contexts in which this is the sort of 
initiative that will give a really big payoff for your school. So I think that the level of strategic advice coming out of national bodies is absolutely crucial. If you have national bodies that just issue masses and masses of, sort of scattergun approach of, of, of things to try, then it actually can distract local authorities and schools from determining what's going to give the biggest payoff for them in their circumstances. And that's why data is important. Um, I think local authorities are actually, many of them, using data quite well at their level. I think um, tailoring how national bodies use data and the sort of advice that comes out of national bodies is important. And I think that it's not always filtering down, the data doesn't always get to teachers and head teachers quickly enough and in a sort of form that's helpful enough for them to actually use that data to improve teaching and learning in their classrooms. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our, our concern is, you know, time to teach is important for our members. Um, if you want to um, uh, close the attainment gap, teachers are teachers and they like to teach, they need to teach, they want to teach, so we need to get them doing what they're good at. Obviously the Tackling Bureaucracy Initiative of late has, has tried to reduce a lot of the um, bureaucracy burden, the, the extra bits that don't allow us to teach, and yet recently there was still a survey that said that the average Scottish teacher is working 47 and a half hours a week. Um, but the problem is, if you want to support children, a lot of the things need to be done today, not tomorrow, not next week. And as a result, we need to allow teachers time to teach, and I would argue time to support. And time is the greatest thing we cannot buy. Developing issues for curriculum for excellence, developing things for the National Five, the National Six, the New Hire, it gets in the way of some of the aspects of teaching. And when all's said and done, a lot more gets said than ever gets done. So what we need to do is allow teachers to do what they do best, to teach and to support those in front of them. That will genuinely close the attainment gap. Adding legislation that gives us more bureaucracy, I would argue, will not meet that. Okay, thank you. Um, a supplementary from Liam MacArthur. Yeah. It kind of picked up a, a little bit what Mr Bloomer was saying there. I mean, this is a legislature. We are legislators, and, and what we do is legislate. And there's always a temptation to think that, that wielding the legislative stick will, will, will resolve any and all issues. And it strikes me from listening to what you're, you're saying that we've known the issue about closing the attainment gap um, has been around for, 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 for decades now. We have um, any number of different um, uh, solutions that would um, address aspects of it, both through the work of the Roundtree Foundation, through Reform Scotland and, and, and others. And I'm slightly concerned that we may get distracted by putting in place through legislation something that makes us feel good that we're moving in the right direction but actually takes us away from doing the sorts of things that we should be doing, which are, are evident from the Roundtree Foundation report uh, and other pieces of work, and which I think, as the London Challenge has demonstrated, are pretty resource intensive and where the resources need to be channelled to those um, where the, the need is greatest. And I think, Professor Ellis, you, you pointed to the, 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 the numbers of, of, of uh, children in poverty who are not in um, the SMID um, 20 uh, areas. So, in a sense, is there not a risk that with this piece of legislation we're, we're, we're making ourselves feel good because we've put something into statute, but actually we're not getting on and doing with the things that, that, that uh, all the evidence shows us we should be doing in terms of um, targeting the resources, um, forming those engagements with, um, with, 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 the, with, with families, providing the, the support to teachers to, to, to do what they need to do. Is that, is that a, a legitimate concern to have? As long as the legislation does, isn't the be-all and end-all, the legislation is a prompt for other things to happen, and that's what's important. So, for example, if you look at something like homework, the research shows that parents in poverty give their children just as much support with their homework as parents who are not in poverty. The problem is the support isn't as high quality because their own education isn't as good, and they're not on the sort of networks that can actually help them get get that support. I bet there's not a single person on your committee who's had a child doing hires who hasn't at some point phoned a friend to actually get an answer to a homework query that child's had. So the issue is about, if, if, you're, looking at, um, if you're looking at what you need to do, it's you need to provide homework clubs, you need to make sure that the right kids are coming to those homework clubs. And again, the recruitment methods for that are different. Um, you know, 
if, if you want kids in poverty to come, you need to have peer-to-peer -peer recruiting rather than teachers or parents um, necessarily telling kids to come. So there's, there's lots of implementation knowledge that schools need, and national bodies could actually be um, broadcasting the research on what works and the implementation knowledge so that if um, a school wanted to do that, they actually know exactly what they've got to do to make it work. That in a sense, that in a sense um, I think goes back to what Mr Bloomer mm -hmm. was saying about the, 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 the relationship between SQA Education Scotland and, and, and schools and, and local authorities' education departments. Um, and, and the risk is that with a legislative requirement, we've got resources taken up um, pulling together the sorts of reports that are going to be required under this legislation and not necessarily um, task with putting in place the sorts of, of, of relationship and activity that, that, that you're talking about. I think that's why a light-touch legislation is really useful, but a legislation that does ask local authorities to collect hardcore outcome data about what's working and what isn't working rather than the sort of data that Sally was talking about, about what people like to do. I wonder if I can just add one thing, which is that it seems to me, <clears throat> I'm not sure whether uh, this counts as going into legislation, but if there was a, a policy of more evaluation, I mean, you just mentioned um, maybe if you put your efforts into Education Scotland and your money in there, you know, maybe you won't be able to do the other things, and that's very true. And we should have an evaluation of Education Scotland. And certainly the um, Commission on School Reform uh, from Reform Scotland um, put this up, um, how long ago was that? Two, two years ago. Two years ago, two years ago, and said that Education Scotland should be accountable in the sense of being evaluated by 2015. I did ask a senior person at Education Scotland the other day whether there was any move on that, and there has been no move. So it seems to me that you could have, within policy, I'm not quite sure that I understand the distinction between policy and legislation all the time, uh, but you could have something which definitely looked to evaluate to see whether you were putting the money in the right place. Thank you. Um, <coughs> uh, John Adam. Good morning. Uh, I would like to... Uh, try and get a basic understanding of the problem with attainment that we have. Uh, I note the Royal Society of Edinburgh have put in their submission, and there's a quote here from it, over a period of, the, of at least 50 years, many of the most important initiatives taken in Scottish school education have been intended to prove outcomes for the disadvantaged. In these circumstances, the rate of progress is all the more disappointing and demonstrates the intractability of the problem. Now, my concern is when we say intractability, are we talking about it's unmanageable? Uh, the, there's no way we can actually deal with the issue? Have we given up on the issue? You know, the, it's that one part. I agree with everything else that's in the statement, but the intractability bit just makes me think it's, uh, it's almost as if we're saying it's an impossible task. Mr. Bloomer. Well, I think, sorry, I think, was it, was it not from... Oh, sorry, it was from the RSE. I do apologise. I do apologise, Sally. Um, <clears throat> I don't think we were using intractability as a synonym for impossible, but we were indicating that the evidence we have from this history is that it's very difficult to do. You know, you're not going to get it done um, by next Monday afternoon. Um, I thought it was interesting in looking at the evaluation of the London Challenge that they focused on secondary education only for a period of five years, which, of course, is quite long in a, in a government's um, life, lifetime. Uh, but it brought it home to me then that you have to really develop and test and then perhaps redevelop your ideas, and that does take a while, but it is worth it in the end. And they've shown it to be worth it now because, of course, they've extended it to other areas. But it's the fact that there have been successes, and, I mean, sometimes people will identify successes in particular schools or maybe particular classrooms, uh, which is rather different from something system-wide, but nevertheless it does suggest that it's not impossible to change. But I think we're also at the position now that we're in the very early stages of knowing things which are likely to be a fruitful way forward, and we need to put emphasis on that. Okay. So, okay. 
Okay. Uh, the other thing I was going to look at is we've also got the attainment gap is narrowing, but it's it's narrowing slowly uh, over period, uh, and there's clear evidence about the strong correlation between poverty and attainment. Now, what would we say here today that are the the key key <coughs> triggers in that? I know we've discussed it to a certain degree already, but if we can get it in more detail, you know, how how can we deal with this situation? What is the best way forward in your opinion? I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy to answer again. But <clears throat> well, I think um, the relationship with the family and parents is very important, and we have some indications from the work that Roundtree have done of what sorts of things might work well. There are also other things like mentoring, for example, um, which can take a number of different forms that probably are quite promising, but we haven't really got any, any sound evidence. If you look at the, what the official statistics say um, about the families in which the children who attain mess, less um, are likely to come from, uh, they're things like um, education of the parents, particularly the father, I was actually in Norway over the weekend, and I was talking about this, and a Norwegian challenged me and said, that can't be true. The mother's education must be uh, important. So I'm not going to you know, kind of stand on a platform, and I did try and persuade this woman, but I won't do that here. Um, but they're the kinds of things that it would be very difficult to change. And it would be a lot more straightforward to try and change the relationship between schools and parents. There is a figure, I suspect I got it from Keir originally, that suggested that about 20% of young people, um, who include those coming from impoverished homes, don't achieve what we would want them to achieve. And we tend to explain this by saying, ah, yes, well, they come from chaotic families. But when you look at the proportion of families that are chaotic. I mean, I'm talking about drug dependency and things like that. It's only about 1% of families. So what's happening to the other 19%? You know, we really do look <coughs> need to look at something like that rather than taking, um, you know, <laughs> focusing on the view of the impossibility of, do of doing anything. Uh, children coming from poverty, uh, a great deal of poverty in the background. One of the worst attaining groups that we come across in schools that my members deal with are those who are looked after and accommodated. And uh, it's not fair to say that these, ch these children have had incredibly hard lives and uh, it's not fair to say that they are in a chaotic background now. The people who do the looking after and the accommodating, be it in a home or in fostering, um, they strive to give them consistency, to give them the support that they perhaps have never had. And it may take to the upper part of primary or the lower part of secondary before they get any form of stability, but they have missed so much. And they, I always feel, are at the bottom end of the, uh, the attainment gap. Um, and obviously, if they are furthest away from the norm, Perhaps they are something that legislation will help, and the, you know, the rights for um, additional support, you know, children over 12 with capacity, that could be something that could well work within legislation, and we would support that that greatly because these children may be somewhere where the we use the word parent, but the parents a broad church, whoever takes on the parenting responsibility, may not be able to drive the children forward the way the child would like. And to give the child some power, I think, is one of the things in legislation that is very strong and greatly supported. Maybe half a dozen quick thoughts, if I may. There's a lot. <laughs> they are going to be quite, time, you know, they're going to be quite quick. concerned about the time. OK. Um, one, early years. Sue's already made the point about children being far behind before they ever get to the education system. We need to do something more systematic about the period from birth, or perhaps from before birth, through to the age of two or three when they might begin to get, have contact with the education system. Two, Sally's right about the 19%. Uh, and the point was made by Sue earlier on, it isn't that the children of the 19% are not loved and helped by their parents, 
but their parents are less able to help them than some other parents are, and we need, therefore, to do much more to help those parents. Three, relationships in schools are absolutely critical, and getting positive relationships between children and teachers, which has been, I think, something of a success story under Curriculum for Excellence, needs to be taken a lot further. Four, we don't target the resources that we have as effectively on poverty and disadvantage as we might do. I suspect that in Scotland there is now less resource targeted specifically at the disadvantage, uh, disadvantage than there is south of the border. And we must bear in mind the point Sue made earlier that the disadvantaged are not the same as the children in disadvantaged schools. There are plenty of poor children who need to be helped who are attending other kinds of schools. Five, quality staff need to be retained in the schools where they are most needed. And lastly is the point about processes of change which I have already hammered and which Sue very usefully fortified for me when she talked about the nature of the advice that is given out by na uh, national agencies. Too much advice, insufficiently strategic, muddled, unreadable, barbarously written. We need to do something about that. <laughs> one of the... Um one, one, the, as children move through their schooling, you, you do need early intervention, but that's not going to be a complete inoculation against future failure. So you need early intervention before children come to school. You need intervention during primary school and during secondary school. Now, what the research shows is that the families are really important for younger children. As children get older, it's more about peer-to-peer -peer and um, wider outside school networks. So schools need to become very, very consistently good at negotiating with families and liaising with families in a way that is about dialogue, not about broadcast. Mm. They need to become very, very consistently good at putting um, children in secondary schools onto the sorts of employment networks, the sort of industry networks, giving them the, the, the sort of range of vision of where they could end up, but also the actual social contacts that they need to actually get their first um, experiences of, of work. And we know that the research on children's work experiences shows that if you're living in poverty, you tend to not get as an exciting work experience in school as if um, you are a middle-class child with all the contacts that middle-class families have. So that's important. But ultimately, in terms of the actual curriculum, the, 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 the core of how children spend their day, what we know is that children in poverty benefit most from a broad, a rich, a knowledge-rich and intellectually exciting curriculum. And so concentrating not on some sort of grad grind skills-based um, atomistic um, approach or some sort of generic process approach that actually says the knowledge they need don't ma doesn't matter, but actually giving them the knowledge that they need. The research on literacy, for example, shows that you can actually get children so they're quite good at decoding. I mean, the, the evaluations of No Child Left Behind in America on a million and a half kids show that you can get those kids so they're quite good at decoding but they're not good at reading because they don't have the broad general knowledge that a middle-class child has to actually bring to the text and understand it well. So if you want to really equalise opportunities in terms of the school curriculum for kids in poverty, you need to provide an intellectually interesting and exciting, knowledge-rich curriculum that gives them the knowledge that will actually set them up for the rest of their lives. Okay, thank you. Um, We've got a supplementary from Siobhan McMahon. Thank you, convener. It was based on um, a lot of the evidence has suggested that we need evidence-based approaches, but then, and which I agree with, but then a lot of the evidence has also said there isn't enough evidence based out there, and we're not doing enough in that field. Um, so I'm just wondering how long it would take to have effective evidence-based um, collection, and therefore to work on that. How long do we estimate for that? And secondly, it came up in evidence there from Professor Brown, but it was in the Joseph Rowntree Foundation um, about mentoring. I just wonder where those volunteers would come from. Who do we think will be doing the mentoring? So it's all very well and good proposing it, but where should we be looking for our mentors? Well, the, the data on mentoring shows that, as a whole, mentoring is quite um, is, is not a particularly powerful um, way forward. But for some particular groups, it's very powerful indeed. So, for example, Strathclyde, for several years, has run a really successful mentoring program for kids living in poverty in Springburn, who should be going to university and should be, you know, doing law, medicine. 
um, dentistry, all these sorts of things, and in fact have no relatives at all who've ever been to university. Now, our mentoring programme for that works really well because it's really tightly targeted. Um, there's quite a lot of evidence that shows for mentoring that mentoring for looked-after children, for example, is actually a very difficult thing to do because these are children who are already vulnerable, and if you do mentoring in a way where the mentoring programme breaks down, it's another source of failure, and it can actually do harm rather than good. So knowing it's not just sort of like the headline of the intervention that matters, it's how you actually implement it. And the thing that evidence can indicate what might be worth trying. But Scottish schools and local authorities need to be collecting data to actually look at, is it working in that particular context? I think you've got two different problems with evidence-based um, approaches. One is the American approach, which says that fidelity is everything, and you have to, this is the program, you have to do it to the letter. And what very quickly happens is that um, teaching becomes very mechanistic and doesn't actually intell intellectually engage kids and the curriculum becomes very crowded and not joined up so we don't want that but what we do want is the diamond that Sally talked about where you've got proven promising and unproven um, um, inter interventions and schools go first for the proven if there's no proven they go for the promising and if there's no promising they go for the unproven but as they're doing the implementation, they are constantly attending not to what they're providing, the input, but to the actual impact on the target group that they want it to have. So that use of data can actually make the education system much more sustainable, much cheaper, and much quicker and slicker to actually respond to the issues on the ground, which is what a good education system will do. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Um, can I call Gordon MacDonald? Thanks very much, convener. Um, the bill places uh, a new duty on local authorities to provide school education in a way that gives due regard to the desirability of reducing inequalities of educational outcome. But we already have um, national priorities, uh, including the requirement to raise standards of education attainment for all in schools. And we've got the Equality Act of 2010 which has the public sector equality duty, which says those carrying out a public function consider how they can positively contribute to a more equal society through advancing equality. So given that we have the national priorities and we've got the Equality Act, do we need further legislation um, to specifically refer to reducing inequality? I mean, all political parties have been... Um, struggling with this for decades about how do we close this attainment gap. Will, this, will further legislation help us to achieve that closure? Policy. Yeah. Um, legislation is legislation on a page, but yeah. if it doesn't affect a change, yeah. it's not to write the words, it's to make sure the words make a difference. Yeah. And if the legislation affects a change in policy and the current practice within education authorities, then yes, it may make a difference. But from the legislation that's already put, been put in part, for, put in place, further legislation is not going to make a proportionate difference, but it may have a proportionate increase in bureaucracy, which will allow people to be less able to support the legislation that's already in place. Yeah. Part one of this bill pious thinking masquerading as lawmaking. That doesn't do anybody any good. <laughs> Don't you hold back here. Just tell it, tell it as it is. Yeah. So, yeah, carry on. Well, I was just going to say that um, one of the things that... Um, it's ridiculous for me to keep quoting Roundtree because I'm here for the Royal Society of Edinburgh, but, I mean, one of the things that... Um, was very striking was that it suggested that what didn't work was having very broad goals without guidance of what to do, whereas what did tend to work is when you really focus down on what does affect attainment. And we don't know all the answers to that yet, but that's what we need to assess. And we do need research. I'm, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm sounding like a, the usual parrot. We um, go on needing research and evaluation. And the government has not been generous in commissioning research. And we have actually, 
as I can say one thing, one other thing, which perhaps you're not interested in today, is that the result of this has been that our educational research community has suffered. You know, people have moved. Um, you have to be very careful that you don't then find yourself wanting to fund research, but you haven't got anybody to do it. But, but given that we've got this bill in front of us, is it better that we pass this legislation or would it be better that we just change the national priorities? Well, that would send a message, wouldn't it, that, mm. um, uh, that, that might not be the message that you, you wanted it to send. I mean, it might, be, it might be saying, come on, let's forget this. We've been at this for years, and so we'll, we'll just drop that. So dropping legislation is um, a very difficult thing. I wouldn't want to say anything firm on that. <laughs> And I, I would come back to my original point, which was that it does actually put it on the agenda for local authorities. Yeah. It means that local authorities do have to look at it every two years. It means that they have to be collecting data. And I think what's important is the message needs to go out to local authorities that it's not just about collecting data for the legislation, it's actually about collecting data that will actually improve teaching and learning in their schools. And the mechanisms for that, for doing that are, things, are through things like school inspections, through local authority um, quality improvement officers. You know, there's a whole load of, of levers that you've got there. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Mary, Mary Scammon. Um, it's on the reporting re requirements uh, again. Um, Cosler's response to this legislation is that the bill undermines local democracy and will provide little in the way of useful information that could aid public scrutiny of education. Um, the Scottish Government uh, th think it would be helpful to have league tables, um, but... I think all of you and everything we read says there is insufficient baseline and ongoing data. Uh, it seems to me that Audit Scotland is probably the best source of data in terms of comparing schools. And in their more recent report, they said there's no consistent testing between P1 and S3. They also say that in Primary 7... Uh, 75% of school pupils meet competency standards in literacy and numeracy. Two years later, 42% meet these standards. So, to be honest, if you want to find any kind of data or comparison, it seems that we're not finding it in the education sector. Uh, I'm also on the audit committee. Um, we're actually finding it in audit uh, from Audit Scotland. So, I just wonder if you could tell me how do we get some sort of national benchmarking? You know, how do we identify the pupil in whatever school he's a, he or she is in? Uh, how do we identify that pupil that's falling behind with the rest of the class, give them the support they need uh, in order to, uh, uh, to keep up? And how do we compare uh, school against school, local authority against local authority, without having the politically unacceptable tests and league tables. That's what I'm struggling with. You, you don't want tests and league tables. What they tend to do is they do tend to form the sort of um, voting with your feet that happens in England, and you then get these very polarised school systems, which are very, very hard to shift indeed. But what you do want is, and it's also <coughs> probably not very helpful to teachers, but certainly primary teachers, to have... Day tests that put children on a general level, and it's not quite clear why those tests, why those children are on that level. It requires a further level of analysis. So, what you want in terms of data for teachers is you want data, you want teachers to get data quite quickly, quite easily about the issues that make a difference to children's progress. So, for example, in literacy, that might be. Um, Decoding data, which might be um, observations and running records and um, book levels. It might be comprehension data, which might be standardised test. And it might be engagement data, showing how much children read and how much they want to be reading and how they see themselves as readers, um, which would be a survey type of, 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 of data. But what you want is probably not all that data to hit all the schools at all the times. What you want is class teachers to be able to call on that data when that data is going to be most useful for them to have. So having a national bank of, 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 of surveys and tests that um, schools could actually form their own local um, um, 
policies about when and which years they're going to test, what, they're going, what information they're going to find out when, and how they're going to use that information to move, it for, to move the situation forward, is actually, I think, probably the, one of the most useful things um, that you can do. The important thing about data is data doesn't tell anyone what to do. Data, the important thing about data is it generates a conversation at a classroom teacher level about the pos what the issues are and what the possible ways forward, and it gives the class teacher a grounding so that actually they can try an intervention and then actually go back and see if it's actually working. So I think that having a, a, a data system that actually puts class teachers and head teachers in control of what data they get and when they get it is way, way preferable to having some sort of um, criterion referenced um, national test that gets done at particular year groups at um, all years. The um, issue about criterion reference tests is that very often what then happens is teachers will teach to the criteria, whereas those criteria are actually just proxy measures for a whole load of other things. So um, I would go for um, standardised comprehension tests every day of the week. And of course, if you do have standardised comprehension tests, um, it tells you exactly, you, you can actually measure, um, uh, you can get an overall view as well as um, a, a, a specific view of a class and let teachers use those tests as and when they need to, to find out about their class. So, can I ask, if you're looking for a standardised test, mm -hmm. are you looking for you know, a test that will be used, a national test that will be used in all schools, because I am aware at the moment that many local authorities, I think it's 27 out of 32, buy in mm -hmm. private sector tests from England. There is no mm -hmm. peer appraisal, there, there's no comparison, uh, and, you know, very little that they can mm -hmm. do from there. Are you looking towards Education Scotland or whoever, to look at a national survey, a national test, a national type of benchmarking in order to, not to compare school with school and local authority with local authority, but to identify that child or children who is falling behind. Do we need a national type of test? I think we need a national bank of tests and surveys that schools can call on. I mean, you're right, you don't want to see that much money just walking south of the border um, to... Um, buy things that actually we could actually provide much more cheaply, much more cost effectively and much more responsively in Scotland. Because of course when the local authorities are buying those 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 um, tests from south of the border, they're very often geared towards the sorts of political concerns that you have south of the border. So for example, in one of the tests there's a non word reading um, score. And um, so you have to read words like Bannock that don't actually make sense, but they test whether or not you've been taught your phonics, because um, at one point Mr Gove was very, very keen on phonics. And um, the problem with that is that the kids who do really well on it tend to be the kids um, living in poverty who've been taught a lot of phonics, but actually don't really expect reading to make sense. And the kids who are failing it are the middle class kids who actually expect reading to make sense. So they read a word like bannock and they think that can't be right, that's no real word, it must say banana, and they change it. So you are setting up a mindset um, that actually is not helpful in terms of producing the sorts of readers that we want. So it would be much cheaper for Scotland to produce a bank of surveys and a bank of standardised tests rather than national criterion reference tests. Standardised tests to sorry, actually do that. Standardised on the Scottish population. I, I mean, what we want to see, there's 100 million being allocated by the government mm. to, to addressing the uh, attainment gap. A so, small amount of, amount of money. <laughs> so, if we look at these national tests or surveys, mm -hmm. whatever we want to, to call mm -hmm. them, but something that will be consistently used in all schools, how will they be used to measure whether the money's been well spent, whether uh, we have addressed the uh, attainment uh, outcomes of uh, children from poorer backgrounds mm -hmm. or low attainment? How can, how, how can we know from these tests? That, uh, that the money will be spent and will be effective? Well, if, if you have a standardised test, then you can, you'll measure the, the gap between rich and poor kids on something like comprehension. But to actually improve comprehension amongst children living in poverty, the, the, the options, you need to have good decoding, but you also need um, good reading engagement. 
You know, the average book written for a seven or eight-year-old child has more rare words and more multisyllable words than the conversational speech of a university professor. The only thing that beats it is the expert testimony of a witness in court. So if you want to improve a child's vocabulary, if you want to improve their knowledge, you get them reading widely and you get them reading novels. Now, that um, will impact on their comprehension scores, but the actual hard measure would be comprehension scores. And if it's a standardised score, even if some schools are using uh, a, a test in primary two and another school is choosing to use it in primary three, because it's a standardised score, you will actually have standardised results. And each school will know whether or not they are closing their own poverty gap. And as I said, you've got schools working in very different contexts, so the levers that are going to work in those different contexts are going to be different. Scottish education is surprisingly data poor. Yeah. It's data poor compared, for example, with England yeah. and with a lot of other places as well. And the difficulty is the one really that you have described. How do you increase the flow of data without bringing in undesirable, unintended consequences yeah. like teaching to the test, narrowing of the curriculum and so forth. Yes. Uh, I think if you want to improve this legislation, and you know, I can see that it now having been introduced, it's not simply going to be wished away, although I personally, as you will have understood, would prefer that it hadn't appeared in the first place, I think you should address Clause 4, the one about reporting, and transform that into a section that deals with empowering ministers to uh, expand the collection of data. Um, there is, uh, uh, of course, authority to do that at the present moment anyway, so in a sense you don't require the legislation, but it, it could be a useful vehicle for greatly improving the range and quality of data that we have at the present moment. I mean, much of the information that we have, you've, you've touched on this, standardised tests done... Uh, 27 out of 32 authorities, not 32 out of 32 authorities right. of varying kinds and so forth. So uh, in, in introducing something that enables national comparability, I think, would be helpful. Yeah. Incidentally, I think it's also unhelpful that we've withdrawn from two of the three international surveys that we used to be involved with, and I hope that that will someday soon uh, be rectified. But if you, the uh, legislation were to be changed to give the emphasis upon data rather than on bureaucratic reporting, which incidentally I'm fairly sure will not through to bureaucratic effort in schools as well, because the first thing that any local authority asks to prepare a report on uh, what it's doing about poverty will do is get schools to fill up forms telling them what's happening at, at school level. So there really is a danger of huge amounts of, of, of worthless bureaucratic activity in this. But if it could be transformed into... Uh, something which was helpful in terms of boosting the data set that we possess nationally, that would actually be helpful. I, I'm slightly puzzled. I mean, um, on the one hand, Mr. Blowing, you're saying we should collect lots more data. Um, I presume that effectively that data collection would be done by schools. Yes? Yes. But it's a terrible bureaucratic burden for schools to be involved in reporting what activity they're doing in, term to, in attempting to reduce the attainment gap. What, I mean, effectively, I'm, I'm struggling to understand why one, one set of bureaucracy good and the other set bad. One set of bureaucracy purposeful, the other set purposeless. That's essentially the you difference. Th you think reporting on what schools are doing in terms of tackling uh, inequality and poverty and attainment gap is, is not a valuable uh, piece of you, information? You've got other ways of getting it. I mean, you've got a national inspection system which gathers a lot of this kind of material in any case. I mean, the gathering of data... Is, is objective. Um, the seeking of reports is not. What you will get is competition amongst authorities in order to produce reports that make them look as good as possible. I mean, essentially, not only will you have um, huge quantities of um, bureaucracy, by which I mean useless data collection, but you will also have massive amounts of mendacity which is not hugely helpful to the system either. Sorry, Perry, yes, one question. So, yes, just question. a very brief question. Um, I, I have heard, uh, Sue, I've heard you talking about 
uh, teacher training. And in fact, convener, I think you raised an FOI to say that teacher training in Scotland, if I'm right, includes about 20 hours of literacy training. Maybe I'm wrong. And in England, it's more. But I just wonder, rather than always looking at schools for the solutions, is there something we should be looking at within teacher training that would be helpful to closing yes. this gap? I think one of the really interesting things about your FI uh, FOI information was the range of, uh, of, of, because there was one university that only gave 20 hours, and that's four yeah. lectures and two workshops in third year, and four lectures and two workshops in fourth year on how you teach a child to read, write, talk, and listen from the age of three right up to the age of 13, and it's not enough. <laughs> um, I think that. That, but an, um, another university gave 90 hours. Um, one university didn't know how many hours it gave. So I think that there's, there's an issue there in teacher education. I think there's a broader issue to do with the relationship between universities and local authorities. I think there's a lot of really interesting work going on in local authorities where they are trying to use data, they are trying to use evidence, they're gathering data, but um, that conversation isn't really happening between university researchers and, um, and, and um, local authorities. And again, between um, the universities and the schools, universities can provide a really... Um, there are really good examples. I mean, I'm working with Renfrewshire at the moment um, to um, help raise their literacy rates um, for children in poverty. And so there are really good examples of, of universities working well with schools. But um, you're, you're right that there are things that we need to look at in terms of initial teacher education, in, content, in terms of continuing professional development, and as Sally said, in terms of, of research to actually improve the partnership between universities and schools. I'm not convinced that the current partnership arrangements are sufficiently um, rooted in the sorts of things that research shows matters, even though universities are, are changing them. I'm not sure the model that has been adopted is the best model. Thank you very much. Liam MacArthur. I think both Gordon MacDonald and Mary Scanlon's questions, I mean, obviously there's a, a need um, to establish the strategic priority in terms of closing the gap, but and also gather greater um, uh, data on which to, to base um, policy development, but without going down the route of, of, of bureaucracy that serves no useful purpose. And it strikes me that um, uh, with the national priorities, which, which state um, that we're to raise standards of educational attainment for all in schools, there's a way of fashioning that that, that, that captures the, the attainment gap uh, more clearly. But through the work of Education Scotland, both in terms of testing but also the support for teachers and for schools in terms of making an improvement, that it reflects um, uh, schools working in their own different environments, uh, allows work to be done in terms of um, the use of standardised testing, which allows us to achieve the objective without putting into legislation um, a, a, a reporting commitment that I'm still struggling to see what it delivers in terms of any any real benefit. Comment on that? I think um, there are two things um, that have happened of late. Uh, you need a benchmark to start with, and then you need to find out how far away from the benchmark you get at the end of it. And one of the biggest things that's affected, certainly Scottish secondary teachers, is the moving away from some of the real attainment data that we're getting. We used to use a, a very clunky mechanism called stacks which was um, very much based on um, the attainment and examinations. And lots of children fell through the, through the hole because of incompleting something. So a child could do two-thirds of a course, and they were rated as a fail. But to me, if you're someone who isn't getting dressed in the morning, doesn't get breakfast and struggles to get to school, the fact that you got two-thirds of the course, that's not a failure. That's an achievement. And... It didn't do that, but we've now moved to the senior phase benchmarking tool, the Insight system, which is much more looking at not attainment, but achievement. So we've kind of closed the sieve a wee bit and that we catch these kids now. So instead of penalising you for the thing you didn't get, we reward you for the thing that you did. And it carries you on through. But we still don't have the bottom end benchmark as to where you started from to know where you, you got to. Now, looking at the London project, they started off 
saying this is going to run for five years. We will take data in year one, we will compare the year two data, and by the time we get to year five, we will have changed things through. So it's not comparing apples and apples, it's apples and apple-like fruit by the time you get there. But at least you know the thing that you started with is measurable and repeatable. Our problem is that the foundation is extremely sandy because we don't have, for the reasons that were outlined, a benchmark. If you don't know where you start at zero or 100, then the fact you got to 1400 at the end, whatever these numbers mean, is utterly meaningless. And so we need something that is not a one-year, two-year, next Monday issue. It needs to be five years minimum, or the data from year one is meaningless as the data from year five. So whatever it is we do through legislation, policy or practice, we need a benchmark and we need an end point. And only then can you measure the difference between them. But the problem is, if the benchmark is, let's not go for primary testing, you know, if it's primary three, and the next big thing is when you get at the end of fourth year through the insight tool, well, you're not talking about a five-year investment because five years will not cover those to go from the start to the finish. You're talking 10 plus. And if the PISA scores that come in after what happens this year, we won't be at all sure if CFE has in fact worked as a concept. And that'll be a big problem. I think maybe the other thing that's quite useful to think about in terms of the London challenge is it was very data-driven, but it was also a very tailored intervention. So it wasn't the case of them coming in saying, these are the programmes that work everybody's to do them. It actually paired schools who were with similar sorts of catchments who were high achieving and low achieving in different areas. So it got school management teams to, to visit each other. The um, low achieving schools had... Um, independent outside academic advisors from the Institute of Education in London who, um, who, who brought their networks to bear and their analysis skills to bear. The schools were given highly, highly tailored advice about what they did. And um, the, it's something that isn't really explored in any of the evaluation, but the partnership between the Institute of Education and the schools was absolutely fabulous. The leadership that the schools were provided and the, the, the emphasis on leadership is, is, is really important. And there was an econometric report that came out showing that actually some of the really big gains came when the kids who had undergone the national literacy strategy and shown big improvements in their literacy in the primary sector actually then hit the secondary <coughs> sector. And that seemed to whop on the, the attainment of the, of the schools. So it was a networking approach, but it was very data-driven and it involved experts from outside the local authority and... What school. you haven't referred to there is the, the legislative driver that made that happen. And, and it's not clear to me that there was a legislative driver necessary. No. There was a commitment back with funding, backed with a recognition that a tailored approach to each of the different schools was mm -hmm. what was going to deliver the results. Yeah. Of course, the push and commitment came from London, not from Westminster. I mean, the actual, to get it to going. And, of course, it was then extended to Manchester and somewhere else. Black country. Black, Black country. country, yes. But it wasn't always but, as successful in those, in those two because it was competing. It had a different context of implementation. And it had much less time. Yes, only yes. three years against eight. And I think that, um, certainly, I don't know about the Black country one, but I think the Manchester one... Um, one of the reasons for that was thinking, well, we can make up time, you know, I mean, we can take advantage of London having taken longer. Um, and maybe there's something in that, but how much? Could I just say one thing, which is that it seems to me that in talking about testing, and I think this is uh, really a big issue, in fact, we have it on the Royal Society of Edinburgh agenda for thinking about, but also particularly we have to be careful that we don't put all our emphasis on the senior phase. Um, actually, we need to do a lot more work on the basic education phase. I think that's something that we would certainly be wanting to um, emphasise in the future. And of course, I can't say anything about what tests one should use now, but just to say that even if you use standardised tests from elsewhere, they can, of course, always be adjusted to be valid 
in whatever it is you're aiming to assess. But you do have to be very clear what it is you're aiming to assess. And when we've talked most of, of the, this morning about things like literacy, I think literacy is terribly important, but it is not the only thing that is important. There are many other things as well. Um, Colin Beattie. Yeah. Um, section 20 of the bill requires uh, education authorities to appoint the chief education officer. The, the, the bill doesn't give the CEO any particular statutory function, but the role is to advise the authority in carrying out its functions in terms of the relevant legislation. Now, it says that the officer's qualifications are to be set by the Scottish ministers and regulations, while the officer's experience is to be determined by the education authority. I'd be interested in the panel's views as to what the qualifications should be and what the experience should be. Do you want to again kick us off here? I think some people will see that the director of education, as they, they once were, will ipso facto be the chief education officer. But they're two different roles in many ways, because a director of education is, is a, a CEO of a small company, and you don't really need to be a teacher to be a good director of education. In fact, some people have proved that not to be the case. Uh, no names. Uh, I've been very careful, very careful. Um, however, I think to be a chief education officer, your principal business, your meat and your murder is education. And I think one of the, um, one of the qualifications would need to be GTC registered. Uh, I think it's a very important. In terms of experience, you're moving out with the, the remit of this building. Um, but certainly, you would need someone who spent some time in schools. And uh, not necessarily a head teacher, but some time in schools. So they know what the people that, that you are directly in charge of, who deliver the education at the, at the chalk face, you know what they do for a living. Because if you don't know what they do for a living, then you cannot call yourself a chief education officer. You can't be a chief if you don't know what your Indians do. I, I mean, my understanding is that it was bringing education into line with the legislative requirements on, for social work and that um, mm -hmm. it's just a tidying up of the, of, of the situation as it is. But... Um, yes, I, I do have a view, but um, <clears throat> I'm not sure that it's answering your question <laughs> straight away. I mean, it seems, it seems to us that it's very important that governments um, control policy. I mean, that's, that's what they have the opportunity to do. Um, in fact, um, what then happens is a question of to what extent do you then start micromanaging at all the levels below policy? And we tend to think that that has to be left to the uh, professionals who are in place. So we would expect that if there was going to be an insistence on a particular post at local government level, it would be in response to a problem. And we haven't been persuaded that there is a problem. You will have noticed in our um, um, uh, written comments to you, we've said that there is variation now across the uh, local authorities in the place of an education list, only in one case are we aware that somebody doesn't have an education background. But we are simply not persuaded that this is a valuable suggestion. I think the, the key issue is how appropriate is it for national government to be prescribing through legislation the management structures of local government? I'm not persuaded that that is the right thing to be doing. So, uh, it, and it doesn't incidentally bring it into the same uh, position as the post of uh, Chief Social Work Officer because as the legislation, proposed legislation currently stands, there are no particular duties prescribed and no powers prescribed. And that's quite different from the setup in re relation to the Chief Social Work Officer. So, I'm not persuaded of the, of the need for this clause and therefore I have nothing to say about what experience or qualifications you should be seeking for it. Given that this is a role which is limited to providing advice, 
Do you think the role, that this particular role should in fact have a, a stronger purpose than just giving advice, presumably being a, a centre of uh, knowledge about education and so on that people can tap into? Concern that is dependent on how the local authority organises its business, what its beliefs are, what its ideology is, if you like, the actual role that would be played. I mean, in all cases, it seems to me that you have an education input, and that sometimes is along with social work, and sometimes it's along with the library service, or both of these, and so on. But it is, I suppose I'm really going along with what... Um, my colleague um, Keir Bloomer has just said, which is that it really is the business of the local authority to decide how they do their education business. They do, of course, have to be accountable for it as well. I'm not suggesting they're not accountable. But, no, I really don't have an answer to your question, I'm afraid. I think, I think it is something that Addis have asked for, and they're the people on the ground. I think that it is possible and would not be desirable, but it's technically possible to have education decisions being made by people who have no experience of education at all because they're from leisure, they're from social work, they're from a whole range of different backgrounds. And I think that what... And ADES are very concerned about that, obviously. So I think that we do actually need to listen to the professionals on the ground and actually look at the extent to which... Um, you know, if, if they're saying this is something that's needed, I think that we need to read their submission carefully and, and take what they say. Given that there's been a huge amount of change within local authorities in terms of their organisation and who's responsible for what, um, is, there a, is, there, is there a case that, uh, that this, this person could be covering more than one local authority, providing expertise across, uh, across a wider range? <laughs> really <laughs> I mean what you want is someone in when local authorities are making decisions about how they allocate their funding about which projects they go for about how they analyse the data they've got to actually look at what are the actual education implications of that you want someone who actually understands education on the ground who understands schools as Ian was saying who can actually inform that conversation now it would be a not, a, not a good situation if a local authority didn't actually consult anyone in education on that but it is perfectly possible at the moment with current situation that you could have that situation arising and it's obviously not going to make good decisions for Scotland you know for Scottish kids if you don't have someone in there in the local authority who actually knows about education that helping local authorities actually it's the conversations that come out of data that matter and in those conversations you want to make sure you've got a good voice for education and not just a voice from social work from leisure from all the other sorts of um, um, positions that you could have who could form the entire committee that looks at the education data but coming back to the, the point you made about the organizational changes Clearly, there's, a, there's mixed views as to who would be most appropriate for this role. Um, one council suggesting that uh, the education officer wouldn't need an education background, which clearly seems well, to me a little odd anyway. But uh, there's, other, there's other people who've been, who are carrying out these sort of heads of service and so on without, uh, without any educational qualifications or experience. Isn't this legislation sort of filling a gap, making sure that we have a certain degree of expertise available, at least for advice and reference purposes within the local authority? I said earlier on that I have considerable concerns about the capacity of local authorities to deliver what has traditionally been the role of that middle tier of governance in education. Um, and there is no question that has been exacerbated by the financial circumstances that we've been in in recent years very few authorities can now afford to have what we would have, would have traditionally regarded as a direct <coughs> education. So uh, you have got much larger agglomerations of services uh, under the control of a single director. But these are difficulties that seem to me to require to be addressed in a much more fundamental way. I mean, I would have thought that this parliament sooner or later has got to look at the position and organisation of local government in the post-devolution circumstances, because, of course, the setup that we have now predates 
uh, the setting up of the Scottish Parliament by, well, the legislation by five years and the um, implementation by three. Uh, and looking at that in uh, looking at it in that kind of a fundamental way seems to me to be far more appropriate than what is really a kind of tokenistic action. Uh, I mean, as far as I understand it, in a, in a sense, what you're saying confirms it. Uh, the job has no powers, um, no established qualifications, no established role, and yet it's held to be uh, a good thing. I mean, I, I find that a little difficult to understand. Well, I think the point is that the qualifications will be laid down by the Scottish ministers and regulations. Yes, but I, I would have thought that if there was a clearly established problem to be resolved, there would be a good deal more clarity at this stage about how it is to be resolved than appears to be the case. Uh, can I thank you all very much for attending this morning? Um, we are most grateful for your time. Um, I'm going to suspend briefly so we can uh, uh, change over the panel. Thank you very much.
Uh, can I welcome our second panel this morning, uh, which will cover issues relating to ASL rights and the Section 70 complaints of the Bill. Um, can I welcome to the Education Committee this morning Sally Cavers from Children's Scotland, Irene Henry, Quality and Human Rights Commission Scotland, Jim Martin, Scottish Public Service Ombudsman, and Ian Smith, Inclusion Scotland. Can I welcome all of you to the committee this morning? Um, as with our first panel, I'm going to move straight to questions from members, and can I start with Liam MacArthur? Thank you, Convener. Good uh, morning to you. Um, if I could maybe touch on the issue of the definition of capacity. Um, I, I see in the written evidence we've had uh, concerns raised by a number of uh, witnesses, including the Faculty of Advocates, that suggest the definition of capacity is not consistent with the current law or the Equality Act uh, 2010, and I, I think thereby um, perhaps giving rise to potential for confusion. The faculty goes on to propose that the bill be amended so that a child of any age who understands the issues may access legal remedies with a rebuttal presumption that a child aged 12 understands, i.e. it is assumed the child is capable unless shown not to be, and the possibility of showing that a child under 12 has capacity. I wonder if um, witnesses maybe be able to offer their views on the, the potential for confusion here, and, and if there is that potential, what the what the, the, the potential remedy uh, ought to be in relation to capacity. Um, okay. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> um, no reason is given in this um, bill to move away from the Age of Legal Capacity Scotland Act 1991, which deals with the question of capacity um, of children. Um, and that's, the, that's what works in relation to disability discrimination claims that are heard before the Additional Support Needs Tribunal as well. Um, so this proposal in terms of the bill would be to apply a different test. No reasons given, nor are we aware of any reason to um, deviate from the principles of the Age of Legal Capacity Scotland Act. Um, the Equality Act, um, the change that was made in that, which came into effect in 2011, it simply transferred the jurisdiction, um, the place where claims under the disability uh, discrimination claims would be heard from the Sheriff Court where they were in previously, um, as where other discrimination claims remain. Um, so the Equality Act um, provision changed that so that from 2011 those claims were then held, heard in the Additional Support Needs Tribunal. It's the age of legal capacity that, that deals with the principles um, as to whether a child is considered to have capacity. And we too feel, as the Faculty of Advocates did, that this is the, the, these principles should apply equally. Here, um, there's no reason to move away from that. So that the Age of Legal Capacity Act um, provides that a child who's 12 or over is presumed to have capacity. So that means they're taken to have capacity unless there's evidence that, um, that challenges that. Children under 12 may have capacity if they have sufficient understanding. Sorry to, to interrupt, but, but you would also then uh, have concerns about the inclusion specifically of references to, to disability. Would you, you you would see that as already covered by the um, by, by the, the legislation that currently exists, and that there's not a, a case for moving away from that or, 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 or referencing it specifically in this piece of legislation. So our position is that the age of legal capacity covers um, what's needed here. Um, in terms of the definition that's within the Additional Support Needs Act at the moment, and the, which is about the establishing of children's views, and the proposal that that would be the test that would apply for um, whether a child has a right to make a, a reference to a tribunal, um, there is that further difficulty with that, which um, is that as it stands, um, the definition is one which runs the risk of not complying with um, the United Nations Convention on uh, Rights of persons with disability, because rather than focusing on the, the question of um, understanding, which is the first part of the test, it adds a second part, which is problematic, because that then, um, in terms of section 3.2 as proposed, um, goes on to say that a child or young person um, lacks capacity if they don't have sufficient maturity or understanding by reason of mental illness, learning disability, developmental disorder, and so on. Um, the, the test should be about the, the understanding and not whether that arises from a mental illness or a disability. 
Yeah, is that the same position for inclusion? Yeah, the concern is that uh, the legislation has proposed, although we welcome in, uh, the, the policy to extend the rights to uh, children with, uh, with uh, capacity in the relation of uh, additional support needs, but we are concerned that the proposed legislation in the, in the schedule is not compatible with the United Nations conventions, both on the rights of the child, but also specifically on the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Disabled People. Uh, article... Uh, let's get the number right. Uh, so, Article 7 uh, 3 of uh, the UNCRPD states that state parties shall ensure that children with disabilities have the right to express their views freely on all matters affecting them. Their views are being given due weight in accordance with their age maturity on an equal basis with other children uh, and to be provided with disability and age appropriate assistance to realise that right. What concerns us here is that rather than being given the same rights as children who don't have disabilities, uh, that children with, uh, who have additional support needs will have to jump through an additional hoop of proving they have capacity before they're able to access their rights. Uh, it seems to be the wrong way around. The legislation as it's framed seems to be about trying to, to, to make ch have a situation where children have to prove they have capacity if they have additional support needs, rather than a presumption that they have capacity, uh, as uh, was, was said by, by Irene, uh, if they're over the age of 12, and, and indeed if they're under the age of 12, if they can, can be shown they have the maturity to make the decision. Um, that is a, a major concern to us. We don't think it's compatible with, with, the, with legislation. Uh, in addition to that, I know that we'll talk a bit more about the best interest part, but we then feel that in, in addition to uh, having to then prove that you've got capacity, the local authority may then just say, well, you've got the capacity, but you still can't uh, make the decision because we don't think it's in your best interest. So you're given the right to be participated and then refuse the right to use that right. Uh, so in our view, the legislation as put out in the schedule is not compatible with the EU, uh, with the United Nations conventions. Uh, and uh, we think the, um, the bill needs to be amended. I think a key part of this is that there is no consultation on the issue of capacity uh, when the, um, the, the question about extending the rights on additional support needs uh, was consulted on last year. The issue about the definition of capacity was not part of that consultation, and we feel that this legislation goes way beyond uh, what is reasonable to put forward as legislation without proper consultation of the consequences of it. Um, if I were to make a suggestion as to how this might be resolved, it would be simply to, to stop the issue on capacity at, uh, on, on the proposed Schedule 3.1 um, and uh, not include Schedule 3.2 or 3A. Um, it's possible that we then include a, 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 a right to make regulations or statutory guidance, which can then be further consulted, consulted on, on the process for assessing capacity where there is a doubt as to whether a child has capacity. But at present, I don't think the legislation is compatible. Just, just two things really to, to say on that. The first is, is an agreement with Jim that we don't want to introduce um, the extension to, of these rights to children and then put unnecessary barriers in place to them um, being able to access their rights. Um, however, we, in our written evidence, we haven't uh, particularly um, said very much on the capacity issue. Um, we absolutely support what the Equality and Human Rights Commission have said in terms of um, the guidance um, that would be required to local authorities about the assessment on capacity. Um, and we would like to see it minimised um, any um, likelihood that um, disputes are going to um, come around with the introduction of, of this proposed legislation. Um, so we would say that um, that guidance would have to be uh, quite detailed and, and really um, ensure that local authorities were able to, to demonstrate impartiality um, in, in their consideration of capacity. It's interesting, uh, Ian, you mentioned the, the, the lack of consultation on the definition of, of capacity, and, and certainly with the previous panel there were a couple of areas where I think um, similar concerns had ar uh, arisen. Is, is there any indication from the discussions you were having in the, in the lead-up to, to the bill as to why that consultation didn't take place at the, uh, originally, of why it is that suddenly there was felt to be a need to, to define capacity within this legislation? Or has it really come out of left field for everybody? Certainly we were not uh, involved in any uh, discussions about capacity and we made a submission to the original consultation document last year, but there was nothing in that, as I say, that 
uh, said other than that children with capacity would have these rights. It did not actually indicate that we then seek to redefine capacity. Um, we, the assumption, I think, would have been that the existing um, definitions of capacity, as, as was mentioned uh, by Irene, uh, would, would actually apply to this legislation rather than a new definition of capacity being brought in, which is effectively what this legislation is doing. Uh, and it is quite a significant change to... Uh, the definition, and it is actually discriminatory because people with, who don't have the ASN would, do not have to prove their capacity, but people with, a, with the ASN will have to prove their capacity, and I, I think that's a, that is quite clearly discriminatory. Yeah. Um, can I move on to, it's, it's a connected um, question to the one we're just dealing with on capacity, which is effective with best interest tests. You mentioned Ian in one of your earlier responses. Obviously, the bill introduces um, a test of best interests um, applied to both children and young people. I, I just obviously there have been concerns expressed in some of the written submissions we've received from, including Inclusion Scotland and some others. But uh, others have been more supportive of the introduction of this test. And indeed, the Scottish government on the 28th of April, the officials um, provided um, an explanation of what, why the best interest test uh, should be included. Um, and I just wondered whether, for example, uh, let me start with yourself, Irene, um, whether EHRC could expand on their views that the best interest test is not compliant with the Convention, which is what you submitted to the committee. Well, we welcome the aim of the bill, which is to extend the rights of children. Mm. Um, and obviously that's an aim which is consistent with human rights and um, in line with the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Children and um, Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability. We're concerned that the way the bill is framed, in particular, this preliminary assessment of capacity that we've just discussed there uh, for both children and young people, um, and the preliminary best interest tests combine to undermine the purpose of the bill, um, in particular where both assessments are proposed to be carried out by the Education Authority, which is in effect the authority which would be challenged by any reference as being the body with the duty in relation to additional <coughs> support needs. And it's that um, concern. The way it's proposed to work, th there are these two preliminary hurdles. The child, um, if a child wants to exercise the, the right that's proposed, then they must notify the education authority of the intention to exercise those rights. And it's at that point, that very early point, that the Education Authority assesses capacity. That's the proposal. Um, if, there's, if the views reach the child is not of capacity, the ch child cannot make the reference. The child doesn't have the right to make a reference. Equally, imposing the best interest test at that early point, where the child has the intention to exercise the right, um, means that if the Education Authority um, is of the view that it's not in the child's best interest, then the child cannot exercise the right. So it's not, in effect, giving the child the right to, to make a reference. It's letting someone else decide whether the child gets to exercise the right to make a reference. And that someone else is the education authority, which is the education authority who would be the party being challenged by any reference uh, to... Is your complaint on both parts then effectively the fundamental part about the, the assessment itself or the fact that it's the education authority or both? I think both. Both are a concern. Um, having a best interest test at this stage where there's an intention to exercise the right is something that's, that's not there, for example, in disability discrimination claims, which are heard by the Additional Support Needs Tribunal as well. And I think it's important to look at what capacity is. It's distinct from best interest. Capacity means that you have um, sufficient maturity and understanding. Um, you understand um, enough to be able to take the decisions to, to understand the risks. Um, the SPICE briefing that accompanied the bill gave a very useful example, not directly analogous, um, because it's in the context of uh, consent to medical treatment. Um, but the issues are the same, the principles are the same, and um, it's a quote from the text by Wilkinson and Noreen, it's stressing the importance of how in, in relation to consent to medical treatment, once a decision has been taken that a child has capacity to understand, then that means that they have the capacity then to take decisions which may not necessarily be in their best interests as viewed by someone else. But that's logical because 
the, the test of their capacity is based on their understanding, which includes an understanding of um, those risks. Um, and there's a concern in particular too about the proposal here because it's introducing the best interest test for 16 and 17 year olds, which is a retrograde step because young people at the moment have rights to make um, references um, and there's no best interest test at the moment. So that would be a, a retrograde um, step. And as I say, it's not something that applies in relation to other um, claims. The concern is it's not actually giving children the right, it's um, letting someone else and in particular, it's the yeah, education I'll, come, I'll come to you in a, in a second, but just, just to finish this with Irene, uh, d given what you said about the medical example you've just given, um, the Scottish Government official uh, gave us an example um, of a speech and language therapist, uh, and that person was, a child was assessed in need of a, a speech and language therapist. Um, the child did not want to engage with that person anymore, and that would be seen, deemed to be acceptable and agreeable, that that would be fine. But... Um, they then, if they had the right, they then could go on to use that right to remove completely the support. Rather than objecting to the individual, they could remove completely the support, even though that had been identified as a necessary and helpful, and it was in their best interests, that they had a speech and language therapist. So I presume your view would, still, would be the same. Uh, that wouldn't change the view that to the example that was given by the, the Scottish Government official. It would still be the, exactly the same as the one you gave for the, the medical example. So what would happen is if the child has capacity, they, would, they should, in our view, have the right to make a, a reference to the tribunal. And if, they're, if that's on the basis they're unhappy that their need has been assessed as being one that requires that speech therapy, it would then be for the tribunal to decide, given the child's um, dissatisfaction with an assessed need. It's not about the, the individual, it's about the assessed need. It would then be for the tribunal to decide, uh, taking into account the evidence, whether... Um, that was, in fact, in, um, a, an additional support need, which is in the child's best interest at that stage. It shouldn't be a preliminary decision about whether the child has a right to have that heard. Yeah, I think that's a key point. I think there's a misunderstanding, I think, by the Scottish Government officials. Uh, in, in, I've read the evidence uh, in the official report, uh, and I, I, would, I would agree that this issue is not about whether the child has the, should have the right to uh, make the reference for an assessment. Um, which is, uh, once they have capacity, they should be able to do that. The best interest here is a question of what that assessment actually comes up with at the end. Uh, and I think there's a confusion about at what point the best interest kicks in. And the legislation as currently framed actually kicks the best interest test in, uh, not on the basis of the assessment, but on the basis of whether the child has the right to make that assessment, and it's just at the wrong time. I think it's important to recognise that, um, again, this is not compatible with the UNCRPD, um, on Article 12, which is on equal recognition before the law, the United Nations Committee on the Rights of Disabled People has made a general comment uh, on the issue of um, legal capacity and denial of legal capacity uh, and about the, use, the role of substitute decision makers, one of the points of which is, is that uh, substitute decision makers uh, make decisions based on what is believed to be in the objective best interest of the person concerned as opposed to being based on the person's own will and preferences. Um, the view of the United Nations Committee is that substitute decision making is inappropriate and supported decision making is the, is the correct thing to do. Uh, and what um, is proposed in terms of the additional support that's uh, provided, uh, being proposed for the service is to give those children who are wishing to access their rights under the Additional Support for Learning Act um, the support they need to, to do that. By introducing this best interest test, you're actually, taking, you're actually giving them a right by saying that they've got capacity and then taking that right away by saying, we as an education authority don't think you, it's in your best interest. And there's also just one other point I just want to make on this, which I think is quite an interesting one, is that given that the education authority has a statutory duty under the Children and Young People's Act to act in the best interest of what they consider to be the best interest of children, it's, they may actually find it quite difficult to then say that a child who's challenging their decision uh, is doing so in their own best interest because they've already determined what the best interests of the child are. So there's a, you know, it is actually a rather strange uh, circular piece of legislation that's being introduced here. And I really don't understand why a best interest test is being brought in. It's certainly not compatible with the, with the um, conventions uh, and the rights of the children that, that this, this legislation is meant to be bringing in. I'm going, I'm, going to, I'm going to ask a, probably a, a, a layman, very layman question, which is effectively, surely most of us will understand that um, those involved in these uh, cases uh, are trying to act um, in the best interests of the child. In other words, they are suggesting, for example, you know, that speech and language therapists is necessary, even if the child doesn't 
want a speech and language therapist. Um, most of us would think that sometimes children take a view um, which is not necessarily in their own long-term best interests. But the, the, the point I'm making is that this, this, it's not about the assessment of the need that that child has. This is about the right of the child to make a reference on that. So if the child may wish to make a reference and say they do not require the service, but the assessment then determines that they still require that service, that the assessment is the bit with best interest kicks in. It shouldn't be kicking in at the point of with reference. Uh, and that's the problem. The legislation is actually putting the best interest or the second best interest test in, and essentially it's saying, firstly, you can prove your capacity. And in nowhere else in, in the law of, uh, of Scotland, if you have capacity, does somebody then have a chance, a chance to say, well, it's actually, we'll have to decide what's in your best interest of whether you can exercise that or not. Once you've determined you've got capacity, you're entitled to act on what you consider to be your own best interest. Um, but the law of the land then allows decisions to be taken uh, looking at other factors. So the problem here is that they're, they're introducing a block, a barrier to using a right which the legislation is actually meant to be introducing. Uh, once the assessment is being made about what needs the child needs, um, that then determines what the coordinated support plan and the support that's to be given is, is, is to be done. The child doesn't agree with that, they can then challenge that at the tri to the tribunal. Um, but the, at the end of the day, as, uh, as Irene said, the tribunal will make a decision uh, of what they support uh, should be um, and, and will take account of the best interests of the child at that stage and that is the appropriate stage for it to be taken into account. Be clear, thank, thank you for that. And Sally, do you have any, anything to add to this? I, mean, I, just, I just think in terms of um, where there is any dispute or disagreement, um, if a local authority has a role in, in making an assessment or a judgment, what we've seen with the um, additional support for learning framework is, is that can be problematic. However, what, um, what we did feel um, was that we were satisfied with the, um, within the bill the um, provision for children to be able to um, appeal to the Additional Support Needs uh, Tribunal um, of Scotland or to be able to request independent adjudication where there was an agreement on um, capacity and on the best interest tests. So um, we were satisfied that that, that would be adequate uh, in those particular cases. Um, thank you very much. Can I move on now and call Colin Beattie? Thank you, Mayor. Part of what I was going to be asking has already been covered, but uh, let me have another chew at it. Um, I was looking at conflicts of interest, and uh, we've already touched on the fact that uh, both capacity and best interest will be assessed by the local authority or the ASNT. Um, how much of an issue really is that in terms of conflict of interest? Uh, does the, local does the local authority undertaking both these assessments really cause that much of a problem? I don't think so. The Education Authority would assess capacity. We've already talked about our position, which is that it's not necessary and it's not desirable to have that process. The age of legal capacity principles should be what applies here. Um, there shouldn't be this additional hurdle for uh, children in additional support needs um, references. Um, but there is concern that there's a potential um, for perceived conflict of interest because inevitably it's going to be the Education Authority that's um, the subject of the, the reference. The Education Authority has the duties in relation to additional support needs and it's not appropriate that they should have um, that say as to whether a child or a young person indeed can exercise their right has already said that they're satisfied that the right of appeal to ASNT is sufficient in terms of the local, in terms of the local authority being in conflict of interest. Does the rest of the panel agree? Well, I, I don't think it's appropriate to have the capacity assessment and then particularly not appropriate to have that done by the Education Authority. We've already just discussed that it's not appropriate to have the best interest test at this stage. And again, to put that test in the hands of the Education Authority does raise a, a concern of potential conflict. And I don't think that either are sufficiently addressed by, by having a right of appeal. Do the rest of the panel agree? No, I, th I think it's a general matter of principle that a party to a decision should not be making decisions about who can uh, challenge their decisions in a sense. So, I mean, in, in, in that sense, it seems illogical that the Education Authority who is the person who's been challenged about the, assist, the, the assisted support needs um, should have a, a right to determine whether the person who's making that challenge has a right to make that challenge. It just doesn't uh, seem to be part of natural justice. So how should it be apportioned? 
who should make that decision? Well, that, I, mean, I would share the, the views of the uh, of Irene that, um, that unless unless there is a, a, a clear case that a child does not have capacity, then they should be presumed to have capacity uh, in terms of the existing legislation. I mean, a, a capacity is a there is a a legal framework for determining the capacity of, of children, and uh, that should apply to AS. Uh, yes, additional support for learning act as it does to any other piece of legislation uh, and I don't see there's a need for an additional test uh, to be included uh, as part of this act for, to access the rights which this act is meant to be giving. Thank you very much. Uh, Mary Scanlon. Um, I'd, I'd like to look at uh, further potential conflict between parents and uh, children on the role of parents. Extending rights to children highlights that parents and children's rights can sometimes be in conflict and the bill provides that a parent can exercise a right even when the child doesn't want them uh, to do so uh, and various councils have raised the issue of tension between the child and the parent. Um, I actually find this bit quite complex but where a parent disagrees with a decision taken by a child they will have the right to go to the additional support needs tribunal to review the decision by the education authority and similarly where a child is unhappy with the provision of support that's being provided they will have a right to make an application uh, to an independent adjudication or appeal um, now this part of the bill we've actually had uh, the equality and human rights commission faculty of advocates and the additional support needs tribunal have all referred to the complexity of the drafting of this part of the bill, and uh, I'm certainly finding it quite uh, quite difficult to, to wade my way through it. Um, so can I just ask um, uh, the witnesses, uh, did you find these provisions easy uh, to follow? Uh, and if not, is it because uh, uh, the necessarily complex area of law, or is there scope for simplifying this drafting? I think if it's complex to the Faculty of Advocates, um, I think for <laughs> lay people like ourselves and others, it's going to be enormously complex. So, uh, by the way, I did read the Ombudsman, uh, 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 your submission, and uh, I'm not sure if you've got something to say on that, but uh, I'm just trying to bring you in because you're looking quite lonely sitting <laughs> there, you know. <laughs> Get to the Ombudsman's sure section in a moment. But, uh, I, th I think, well, whoever wants to answer, but I imagine Ian and Irene and Sally at least want to say something on it. Ian. Just to it's start, easy uh, to follow and uh, what should be done. I, I mean, le legislation is, all, uh, is always uh, written in a way which is more, more complex uh, than, than I think is necessary, but uh, that is the way of lawyers. But if the Faculty of Advocates thinks it's too complex, then we are, we are as you say, rightly in, yeah. in trouble. I think, as, as I said earlier, I think part of the problem is the schedule, uh, which brings in the detail of the uh, proposal in relation to ex ex extending the rights of children with capacity uh, under the Additional Supports for Learning Act. Um, was not subject to prior consultation on the detail, and I think that is where the problems arise. And I suspect a lot of this is going to be proven to be not fit for purpose. I'm not a legal expert, and I get uh, I get very confused as to, uh, with some of this as well. Um, but I think it's not fit for purpose, and I suspect the best. Uh, um, I would hope that the committee would consider asking the minister whether they would look at. Um, it, not necessarily withdrawing the legislation because we don't want that to happen, but uh, looking at um, minimising what's in the primary legislation to allow proper consultation on the detail to be carried out before finalising it. Because if this bill goes through in its present form, I suspect we're heading for more problems than we are solving. Can I just say, Ian, what you do say in your submission is you're concerned that the proposals in the bill undermine the principles of... Uh, children with additional support having the same rights as other children. That's quite a serious allegation if you're saying that this bill is undermining that fundamental principle. I wonder yeah, if you'd the, mind. The, the fundamental principle is that, uh, from the, the UNCRPD is that uh, children with disabilities should have the same rights as any other child. And my concern is that by bringing in things like the... the capacity test and the best interest test, they're actually not, being, they're not having those same rights. And I see that's one way to simplify things would be to yeah. use the framework of the Age of Legal Capacity Act and therefore you wouldn't require these um, processes about children having to notify their intention to exercise their rights. You wouldn't need to have assessment of 
capacity by education authorities and you wouldn't have a best interest test, so you would be um, simplifying um, the legislation by taking all of that away. Um, the definition in, in itself, um, as I'd already mentioned, there's, there's difficulty with that in, in terms of compliance with the UN um, Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability, and the opportunity could be taken now to look at that um, in relation to the provisions for establishing the wishes of children as well. I'm not sure either of you have addressed the point about the bill providing that a parent can exercise a right even where a child doesn't want them to do so. Is, you know, is that reasonable? Is that fair? Should that remain in the bill? It's the conflict between child and parent. Yeah, quite, I mean, this is about the conflict of interest between a parent and a child's rights. Yeah. It's yeah. that aspect of the bill. Yeah. There are going to be, and I think there are going to be situations where you may find uh, differences of opinion between the child, the parents and the education authority. And um, I think what this bill doesn't actually do is perhaps provide a, a mechanism for resolving that in a way which doesn't require going through formal procedures. I and mean, one of the concerns that we have is that uh, I know it's not shared by... Other, many other organisations, though it is by the Faculty of Advocates at least, is that um, the children will not be able to exercise the right on me using mediation services, because we would have thought mediation services might be the most appropriate way of dealing with situations where there's a conflict between parents, children uh, and the education authority about the right way forward. Um, and I'm not entirely clear. Uh, I, I don't, I, in fact, I totally fail to understand the reasoning behind uh, that, because in my understanding of mediation is it's uh, an independent facilitator who tries to remove the issues about the differences of power um, between the different parties um, and, and try to reach a common agreement on the way forward. Uh, the children would have support if they required it from the support services which the bill proposes. Um, so I would have thought mediation would be a way forward. Family mediation services which are operated by charities such as Children First already provide considerable support to families uh, in, where there is internal conflict within the family. Uh, and I think that might be a way of addressing the issues that you propose without requiring a complex legislative framework that this bill is currently proposing. Um, okay, your first question is easy to follow. Um, not necessarily, but not unusually so, uh, I would say. Um, in terms of, of conflict within families, I think, I think the bill's right to include this. Um, Conflict, I mean, we're talking about children between the ages of 12 and 15, a period in children's lives where there is quite often conflict, uh, disagreements and uh, differing opinions within families. But what, what we would say is that in terms of um, the support service, so the children's service that's being proposed, we would expect that the four elements of that service would um, do the job required in terms of um, raising awareness but in support of um, of children about how to access their rights and, and some of the the implications of them. So there's advocacy provision within the proposed children's service. It's also suggested um, in terms of the role of the named person that the named person would pass on details of the um, children's service um, to, to all children um, who were wishing to exercise some of these rights. And we believe that's a very important and strong role for, for the named person. And, and obviously every, every child will have a, an allocated named person um, able to fulfil this role. I think the, sorry, sorry, the I was problem... Sorry, going to bring in Irene, though, okay, before fine, you do. Yeah. I was just going to say, we didn't comment specifically on mediation, but I would agree there would need to be a good reason, which I don't think has um, been established to exclude children from, from that right as well. Um, and I would agree too that mediation can often avoid um, the need for a matter to be heard by the tribunal. Um, and I would have thought with appropriate support, um, children would be able to participate effectively if they have capacity. Um, in relation to conflict between parent and child in disability discrimination claims before the additional support needs to tribunal, um, either a parent or a child um, can make a claim. It's then for the tribunal to, to listen to evidence and make an assessment, again, taking um, the evidence into account um, and resolving any conflict of views um, as part of that, um, the tribunal hearing the claim. In relation to conflict between parent and children, one issue that we've not mentioned so far is, is looked after children. Um, and I think there is a particular concern for looked after children. In fact, Govan Law Centre have recently done some research um, into looked after children with additional support needs. Um, and I've said that of over 12,500 looked after children in Scotland with additional support needs, 
almost half of them, according to their research, have not been assessed for a coordinated support plan. And of those who do have a coordinated support plan, none of them have ever been appealed to tribunal. Um, there are very few cases um, heard by the additional support needs tribunal dealing with um, references in relation to looked after children. I think that is an issue of concern. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Chick Body. Yeah, we were talking about the conflict of interest. Who decides the capacity of the parent, or indeed the education authority? MD even won't attempt maybe to answer Martin, that question. Maybe Mr. Martin can help us. My life looking at the competence of local authorities, so um, I'm probably the wrong person to ask. <laughs> no, but I mean, I ask the question seriously. I mean, I know there's you know, tribunal and, and the balance, but at the end of the day, it's a reasonable question in, in some cases, not in every case, as to what the capacity of the parent is, particularly, and in some cases, what the capacity of the education authority is. Basic principle of law is that, that adults are presumed to have capacity. If you have a mental have for children, well, under the Age of Legal Capacity Act, that is the, the position in relation to children who are 12 or over. There's a presumption that they have capacity. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that, um, Mark. Mark Griffin. Thanks, Touched on the uh, complexity of the provisions, uh, I just wanted to ask to to clarify. Um, uh, in relation to complexity, is that because this area of law is complex and so the bill as drafted is necessarily complex or is there scope to um, simplify? I think to simplify it and that will be achieved by removing the provisions in relation to assessment of capacity by the education authority, which is what we would suggest is necessary. Um, to be compliant with the conventions. Um, the Age of Legal Capacity Act deals w with these principles. It works um, elsewhere. There's no reason um, to deviate from that. So it, it would take away all of that area. Um, and equally, the best interest test shouldn't be there either, and that too could be removed. Anybody else? Just, Sally? Maybe just to, just to go back to, to my first response is we don't want to put any unnecessary barriers up in terms of um, children being able to exercise um, these rights. We, um, Children in Scotland, absolutely welcomed the, the proposal to extend children's rights and we want this to be um, a positive experience um, for children and there not to be barriers in place um, and, and some of the discussion this morning has, has illustrated some of those barriers. So my only comment would be that if, if simplification removes some barriers then that would be a good thing. Nope. Okay. okay. Mark, do you have any thought that? Um, Siobhan McMahon, please. Thank you. Um, I want to ask a question regarding the complaints part um, of the legislation, and maybe this is where Mr Martin comes in. Um, <laughs> um, I don't think it'll be hard to follow the question, but let me know. It's really, in the evidence that we've, we've got back from people, there seems to be some disagreement about whether the respective roles of Scottish ministers uh, and the additional supports needs tribunal uh, in dealing with the complaints are clear. I just wondered if you consider that further clarification should be provided on this? Yes. I don't think it should be a difficult thing to do and I don't think it needs to be complex. Um, I don't think it's appropriate for ministers to uh, reconsider decisions that have been made by a tribunal. I think that should be absolutely clear. Um, I think that the system has to be uh, very transparent and I think the current vagueness in Section 70, where uh, ministers can act, I think it's, um, if they are satisfied there may be failings in duties relating to education provision, would have been met by a tribunal decision. Does anyone else have comments on this? I mean, in the um, paragraph 8 in particular, um, in your submission, Mr Martin, um, you do speak about uh, how you yourself as a body are restricted by law. I mean, how do you see that and the compatibility of, of what you already do, um, what tribunals do and what Scottish ministers would be proposing? I think, I think, the, I think it, it is perfectly clear, I think, that um, there's a route to tribunals, mediation 
or adjudication for people. I think that's pretty clear. <clears throat> I think where the confusion may come in is that ministers and the ombudsman have similar powers on complaints. Section 70 is not primarily a complaints section. It's about where ministers can act if they believe that someone is not carrying out a duty or may not be carrying out a duty. And that may come to their attention by a complaint, and it may come by other means. It could come from this committee, it could come from individual members, it could come from the media, it could come from any source that ministers choose. So it's not purely a complaints procedure. But I do think that currently it would be possible for someone to bring something to my office, which I can look at, which would be equally competent for the minister to look at. Yeah, then that's clear. But the other members have a view of whether um, the bill could go further in making the complaints landscape a bit simpler for people and how do parents and, um, and children engage with that? How, how do they become involved in that? Do you have a view? I've been watching with interest the way the committee has been grappling over the last few weeks with overlaps and, and confusions and, and what have you. <coughs> Douglas Sinclair put Scotland ahead, I think, of the rest of the United Kingdom in his report in 2008 when he argued for simplifying the landscape, uh, removing complaints bodies and trying to make it easier, as easy as possible for people to, to make complaints and run with complaints. So we removed the Prison Complaints Commissioner, we removed Water Watch. I've taken on the responsibilities that ministers previously had for prison health complaints. So the direction of travel in Scotland is to reduce complexity, to make it as easy as possible for people using the system to complain. Do you have that complaint resolved as quickly and as well as possible? I think that should be the, the, the theme that underpins everything that we do in this area, and in all the other areas of public service. The way to come at this, I, I don't think, is, is the normal way that we do, is having proposed legislation and then discussing it as a group as to how best to administer it. I think it's best to look at it from the user up. What will be the simplest and easiest way for the, the user to get a fair hearing? And if we present them with a complex landscape, then people will go to the wrong place, they will go around in circles, they will get tired, they will drop out, they won't pursue their, their rights. So I think the job of this committee and other committees, in my view, is to make it as simple as possible for users to find the right route to the right people who can give them the right solution. Yeah. I think what's important uh, in relation to education complaints is, I mean, obviously everyone should have a right to uh, an impartial uh, tribunal or hearing or complaint system, um, that, the, that has to be clear what that system is and who to make the complaint to. But there's also an, an issue of speed that uh, needs to be involved in this because if a, if a complaint is about a child's education, um, you can't afford to delay for months and months and months whilst you go through endless formal processes before it reaches a final conclusion. So I think whatever system is brought in place, it has to be one which is clear, simple, impartial and speedy. Uh, and on that then, the, the speedy and the time scales, I mean, in our evidence that we've received back, a near unanimous view was that the proposed deadlines were at least reasonable. However, if we should streamline the complaints process with reduced time scales, the children in Scotland argued the welfare and well-being of the children, a child caught in the middle of the dispute should always be the primary consideration. So should there be any redress if time scales for resolution of complaints are not met? Do you have views on that? Maybe just to go back to, to your first question as, as well. I mean, what we do, um, so uh, in terms of the inquire service, uh, what we do is try and simplify information um, for currently for, for parents, for children and young people and for practitioners about the additional support for learning, learning framework. And a lot of the questions we get is about um, the dispute resolution mechanisms and about the complexity um, of those mechanisms. Um, so... You know, obviously, on behalf of the Scottish Government, we, we produce information, uh, hopefully, that's in an accessible way um, and see that as absolutely um, critical in terms of families being able to, to access um, the, the correct information about um, how to use these particular mechanisms. Um, I think uh, I've just lost your second question, which was... Just about the... Um the, the timescales and the redress, oh, yeah. would that be lost if, Sorry. if it's if streamlined? Um, yeah, so in, in terms of the timescales proposed, um, yeah, the, if there was an investigation um, required, so it's 
looking at approximately six months um, mm -hmm. at the moment. And I think that's necessary, um, given the volume of evidence that, that is, is sometimes um, accompanying a case. However, just as, as Jim said, the, the impact of being involved um, in dispute and, and, and making a complaint on everybody involved um, uh, is, is really significant. So what we would say is that we are satisfied with that, the proposed timescale, but um, if there was any opportunity to reduce that in practice, the practice then that would be welcome. Okay. Is it important that these timescales shouldn't be seen as the amount of time that it takes to deal with something? They should be outriders. Um, the factors you need to take into account, we, we, this is my, my business really, is the complexity of the issue, the volume of complaints you're going to be dealing with, the availability of evidence and how long it takes to gather it, the availability of expertise and the resource that you have in order to tackle them. And if, if ministers and civil servants have looked at all of these and factored that into their thinking, that is, it's a practical set of numbers, then that's fine. On the face of it, they look reasonable to me. Uh, were I this committee and I had a, a, a member of the, the, the government in front of me, I think I would be asking them, how did you arrive at these numbers? Have you factored in volume, resource, experts, expert advice, or are these would like to have numbers? Because when you deal with complaints like this, Ian is right. It is very, very important that where there is a very an issue that requires speedy resolution that you are able to fast track things and that means having these things on hand and not standing, starting from scratch in every single case. Now I know the number of cases are small which probably means that the resource and experience will, will probably uh, take a long time to accumulate as tough turnover happens. So these are the kind of questions where are you, I'd be asking ministers when they come to, to justify these numbers. Thank you. Okay, uh, Liam MacArthur. Briefly, I was interested by your comments earlier on, Jim, in relation to the, the appeal to ministers. I mean, you may have observed that in the earlier session, um, uh, the, the, the appetite of ministers to get involved in things they really shouldn't be getting involved in uh, was coming uh, under some scrutiny. But uh, to be fair to them, the, the, the government's policy memorandum had looked at, at repealing um, Section 70 and introducing alternative provision that would have allowed complaints to be made to the Ombudsman rather than to ministers. But this, however, uh, received limited support. I, I mean, I find it intriguing that um, we, we have a, a sort of a dual running mechanism for, for, for complaints where you would you pick and choose which referee you, you had and whether or not um, you thought that uh, additional pressure could be applied to, to ministers who may have half an eye to um, how this plays uh, with the wider public rather than necessarily the objectivity of the, the criteria may be tempting. I mean, is, is it your view that we are setting up um, problems here that, that, that may need to be resolved in, in due course, that actually to get back to that streamlined landscape that you were talking about is really where we should be heading and we should be trying to deal with that through the legislation now. Start with a disclaimer. <coughs> I, have, I have never sought more powers or broader jurisdiction for my office. I've always believed that as a matter for Parliament and a matter for Government. I see my role as commenting on that. Were I a child or a parent at the moment, I'd be confused as to where I go. That, can't, that to me just can't be right. So either we need to have very clear signposting about where you go for what, or we have to have a simplified system. But Section 70, as I said at the beginning, is not purely a complaints provision. It does give the Minister power to intervene if they become aware that there may be a breach of a duty, by whatever means, one of which might be a complaint. And I think that's a very important thing to have and an important thing to keep. But I see that as a kind of own initiative power for the minister in lots, lots of ways. And the complaint being the, the own initiative power of the, the user, the child, the parent, whoever that may be. So if we, we are going to keep things the way they are, I think we need better signposting. And can, can I say that uh, Inquire is excellent for that, absolutely excellent. But my, my advice to this committee would be to think from the parent, the child, up rather than from the administration down when you come to decide what's the best process. Thank you, uh, Liam. Could I just check a couple of things I, I wanted to ask of yourself, Jim? Um, are we 
are we clear what the underlying key principles are? If we're going to streamline the, the, the system, um, and we've discussed briefly about the possibility of reduced time scales because the examples we're given, we don't want months and months and months of a child's, a child's education to be interrupted. Um, you know, what, what are the key principles that need to be uh, addressed irrespective of what system we come up with? You mean in terms of how a complaint is handled? Yes. I think the first thing that we do uh, is that we, if someone comes to us we, uh, uh, and we think it's a, a support issue um, we, and the local authority, for example, hasn't acted on it, we try to find out first why. So something that presents on paper as one thing might actually be far more complex and, and what have you. So that has to be determined. And at that stage, we will probably direct people as appropriate, either the tribunal route or to the local authorities. In fact, we, we issued one, in, I think, March this year to Highland Council, I think, where we, we said that their signposting of people on this area w was not great. And we, we asked that all local authorities in Scotland look at how they signpost people. When it comes to my office, we will take a view as to whether or not this is something where I should use my discretion to fast track something. Now, we will do that in some education cases. Very rarely have I done it in that. More commonly, we'll do that in a health case, for example, where someone may be facing a terminal illness. So we do have the power to fast track that. And I think when we look at what ministers uh, are doing, again, one of the questions, if I were you, I'd be asking is, what are you going to do about that fast track element? So if, if you want to put in place a complaints procedure that looks good on paper, that's one thing. But as soon as you start dealing with people, it's quite another. And you have to be take a, a human approach to how you approach these things. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I just wondered whether um, you had any view on the how we could best uh, make sure that anybody who wants to complain, whether it's parents or children, how we could best inform them of their rights in this area. You mentioned yourself a case of poor signposting by local authorities, but um, how can all parties effectively be properly informed of their uh, rights and where they should go? I think you should be at the point of contact, whether that be with the school, with looked after children, uh, where they're being looked after, wherever that is, at that initial point of contact, it should be there. I think what, what tends to happen is people get themselves into a process. And my experience, not just in this area, but in other areas, is that public bodies decide which part of the process you can enter, when and for what. It's very rarely that an individual controls that. So it's important that, that people are educated about what rights they have, what the roots they have, if they believe their rights are not being met. And I think that should be happening for most young people at the level of the school and for looked after children where they've been looked after. We have you here. Um, obviously, we had a discussion. You mentioned it briefly earlier um, uh, about the discussion we had with the Commissioner for Children and Young People um, about overlap. Um, I just wondered what your view was. I know you submitted um, some views in writing uh, earlier on, but I just wondered if you could maybe expand on your views as to whether or not you see problems with possibility of overlap between the new investigati investigatory powers of the Commissioner and the powers of your own office. Um, the short answer is yes. Um, but that is true of a number of organisations and that we find ways uh, to manage these, these down so that incidents where something falls between the cracks um, is kept to a minimum. Um, I think that the uh, processes that I've heard described um, I think will take a bit of time to put in place. I think they'll, they'll take a bit of time to bed in. I think that the, the anticipated volumes will need to be watched closely. I, I, I read somewhere about the number of investigations between one and four and the likely number of you know, approaches to the office being in the region of eight, nine hundred. I think that will have to be managed very carefully. My, my aim here is I will do anything I can to try and help young people to access routes to get things resolved where they think they need them to be resolved. The government and parliament have, have decided that this one of these routes should be through the Children's Commissioner, and my office is committed to try and help them to make it work. But it, it does look to me as if there are a number of complexities in it which will need to be ironed out. 
Given you've just said that, how confident are you that it can be worked out to... There are always overlaps, as you say, and difficulties sometimes, but how confident are you that those complexities can be dealt with in a harmonious way? And not just that, that it's, it's more importantly, that it's clear for the users of the system as to who deals with their complaint. We, we were all public servants. So, I mean, we, we all have a duty to make this work. And we've, we've spent... I don't know, maybe in the last 18 months off and on, talking with the Commissioner about what an investigation looks like, what a complaint looks like, what a front of office, house office looks like, what a process looks like, um, what, you know, what, what you do when you have to disappoint people, which we do at least 50% of the time. The difference between um, having a part of your office which is there to make decisions about things that children bring to you and, and another part being an advocate for children and you know how to keep these separate and, and these kind of things. I'm, I'm confident that we can all work together and, uh, and try to make this work. But I do think it will have to be resourced. I do think that there will have to be a lot of goodwill and I think there will have to be a lot of patience because I don't think this will be up and running on day one. I think it will take a bit of time. And it might be something you want to think about reviewing at some point. Thank you very much for that. Um, I know that wasn't entirely on topic, but seeing as you were here, uh, we're <laughs> I'm, glad, I'm glad you said that. Can I just check one final thing with, with Sally? You know, the, the support service, you've, you've, re you've referenced that a couple of times in your answers um, for children. I just wondered whether or not um, uh, if you're content with the Scottish Government's proposals for the service um, and effectively whether uh, the extension of rights and uh, that, that, that would become available to them under the bill. Um, again, you're content whether um, any plans or proposals to raise awareness um, about the support service are, are adequate. Um, yeah, I think they're adequate. I mean, I think as many people have said in response to the bill is that there's no point in extending rights to children under this legislation unless they know about it and they have support to, to access and exercise those rights. Um, we've already talked about the complexity of the um, dispute resolution framework within Additional Sport for Learning. Um, we consider it absolutely essential to have a children's service as the one that's been described with four elements, so um, information and advice advocacy, legal representation um, and a service that can gather children's views. And we think that those four elements are comprehensive enough to allow um, children to know about these new rights. We also think it's an opportunity, um, as others have commented, to um, continue to raise awareness of the additional support for learning framework, which um, you know, gives rights, um, further rights to, to, to children and, and young people. And we think that um, this bill um, is an opportunity to extend the information that's provided to children generally. Um, what we'd want to see with the children's service is that we consult with, with the target audience of, of 12 to 15 year olds and uh, talk about how they'd like to access the different elements of the service and, and their views on delivery and we would consider that essential before um, anything else happens in terms of the planning or, or the detail of the service. Uh, thank you very much for that and can I thank everybody for their time this morning. We do, as I say, um, appreciate um, you taking the time to come and speak to the committee. We do find it invaluable um, in our work uh, in examining the bill. And can I uh, briefly suspend to allow the witnesses to leave? Thank you.
Uh, item 5 on our agenda this morning is to consider a draft memorandum of understanding on the BBC and its future engagement with the Scottish Parliament. Uh, a paper has been circulated by the clerks and we have also received a letter from the Scottish Government yesterday from the Cabinet Secretary. Um, I, I presume everybody has had an opportunity to read those papers and indeed the uh, letter from Fiona Hislop. Uh, so I am just going to throw open and invite comments. Um, from the members. The purpose of this item, though, is to allow the committee to obviously consider the draft memorandum of understanding and agree any comments that we want to pass to the Devolution Further Powers Committee, who will thereafter report to the Parliament to inform a subsequent chamber debate. Uh, they, are, they are the lead committee um, on this item. But with those comments, can I ask members uh, what views they have on uh, this particular item? Mary. Um, it's really from the, the point of view that um, the draft memorandum is concerned with how the BBC engages and consults with the Parliament and Government and not with the subject matter of programming uh, and activities. Correct, yes. And really looking from the point of view of editorial and operational independence. So what I would like to ask is that um, there has, there's a commitment from the BBC to send its annual reports, annual report and accounts to the Scottish Government and a commitment from the Government to lay these before the Parliament. Now, the accounts are fine. I haven't got any problem with that. But if the annual report is not quite to the liking of the Scottish Government and the Parliament, is it possible that that could stray into, uh, you know, this... Um, the programming or activities, but editorial or operational independence. I mean, if we're being sent an annual report, I understand the accounts, that's not a problem. But if we're being sent an annual report, you know, what is it reporting on and what are we scrutinising on? And if we're not happy with how much has gone to religious broadcasting, educational broadcasting, uh, political broadcasting, or how it's been done, is there the opportunity for the which I hope there isn't, but is, there, is, is it likely that the Parliament could say, well, we don't like the way you're doing this, that or the other. This is, it's just the report I'm not sure about. That, well, I mean, in the, in the Memorandum of Understanding, it's, it talks about the report with reference to covering areas such as finance, administration yeah. uh, and, the and, work work. Of the B, and the work of the BBC. Well, it's, finance I'm OK with, the administration I'm OK with, it's the work. That, that's what I'm not sure about. Well, I mean, it would be no. I mean, I think the, if we go back to the original Smith Commission um, uh, agreement, it says that it would be basically the, it should be the same for the Scottish mm -hmm. Parliament and Government as it is for the UK Parliament. Yeah. yeah. So this is just about laying the report. It would not be. I mean, there's a very clear view about the separation here. Uh, well, and protection of independence, yeah. and particularly editorial independence, of no, the BBC. I appreciate that, and I bow to your superior knowledge, no, being no, a I'm, member of the other committee. But can I just say, convener, uh, paragraph two, annual report and accounts, um, that has to comply with any directions after consulting BBC by the Secretary of State or the Foreign Secretary as to the information to be given in the report about finance administration and work. Mm. And so what I'm seeing for BBC Scotland is they will presumably consult with the Parliament and the Government to decide what will be included in that report. And I'm just asking if there is the potential for that to stray into the work okay. and oper operations of the BBC, that's all. I can only give you my understanding. My, okay. un my understanding is that that's not... It's the nice to hear evidence from the convener. It's <laughs> not the case. Um, okay. it, it, it's supposed to be... Um, about uh, it's just about the input of the report as opposed to not about the actual um, editorial independence and decision making processes of the BBC. So I think it's more about what ends up in the report rather than um, that. I think it's a, maybe, maybe a fine dividing line, but I think it's not supposed to be about the editorial uh, the editorial independence yeah. of the organisation. It's really just to make that clear. Thank you yeah, for the clarity. No, I, I, just, no, I think, I think, it's, it's I think it is an important question. issue. At this time of the charter coming under review and moving indeed, uh, but the, the charter devolved. obviously that is for the charter. I appreciate the charter that. Yeah. Deals with that area and it's not for the government. But the further government. devolution, I think it's important to clarify these issues at this time. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Liam. Yeah, I, I mean, I thought the paper was was helpful, I'd, and and the letter also from from the cabinet secretary. I, I mean, I thought the 
the MOU, the draft MOU, um, was a fairly reasonable reflection of, of what um, emanated from the, the Smith Commission. But obviously, the, the, um, the lead committee will, will take its own uh, view on that. And I, I was, I wasn't quite clear why um, Fiona Hibslop was saying in her letter that whilst the present draft presents some detail on how consultation on the terms of reference for the charter will be agreed, uh, it does not currently provide for a role in determining the, the, the content of the charter. I mean, I think the process of of, of, of consultation seems to be reasonably clear. I mean, some of these things uh, in practice don't necessarily work out as, uh, as intended. But I, I, I didn't, I, I didn't see the, the problem that, that Fiona Hislop was identifying in her letter. Um, but I, as I say, I mean, obviously the lead committee will have gone into this in, in rather more depth and cross-reference yeah. back to, or, or will be going into this in more depth, and we'll be able to cross-reference it with the work it's already done in relation to the Smith Commission. But uh, as it stands, the MOU to me looked at a reasonable reflection of, of what had emanated from that. Okay, thank you. Um, any other members want to comment? I think, I mean, the one thing I would say certainly is that I mean, I I do have um, some sympathy with the. Uh, letter from the Cabinet Secretary, and, and it is on the basis of the, the work of the. I, I, I'm at an advantage being on both committees, obviously, but the work of the uh, Devolution for the Powers Committee has been on the, the principle of trying to ensure that everything that comes out of the Smith Commission Agreement and then is followed up either through memorandums of understanding or through the legislation, it meets what was in Smith, um, uh, if I can put it that way. Um, it has been taken forward. Um, on a unanimous basis in terms of the report of the Devolution for the Powers Committee to try and make sure. So I know we all have different, different views on uh, you know, going beyond Smith or not, but the idea is to try and bring the Parliament um, uh, uh, the opportunity to examine exactly what is being, uh, being proposed and whether or not it meets the original Smith recommendations. And I think that is the, for me, that is the core point of the letter from the Cabinet Secretary where she says that, she, her, in her view, the current draft of the Memorandum of Understanding does not yet fully deliver the role which the Smith Commission outlined. And she makes reference in her letter to a particular point, it be, about it being the governance of the BBC in the same way as for the UK Parliament. The Scottish Parliament should play the same role. So I think there is a question mark, if nothing else, or maybe it may be a question of clarity, it may be nothing more than that. But I think, at the very least, um, we should, when we're writing to the Devolution for the Powers Committee, uh, point out the correspondence we've had, obviously, from uh, the uh, Cabinet Secretary, although I know she has copied in the convener of that committee. Um, but also, I, in my view, certainly, I think it would, the principle would be uh, to ensure that there is a, um, hopefully, a unanimous view of this committee that whatever is agreed, it should meet the both... Uh, the, the phrase that was used by the Devolution Committee was it should meet the spirit and the substance of the Smith Commission. Is that, is that agreeable? We agreed to write on that basis then. Yes. Okay, we'll we'll do that then. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I think the um, uh, we did agree at the, in item one that we would now move into private session for uh, uh, item six. So uh, I'll now move the committee into private session. <laughs>